Special Act Drafting Committee Charter Marathon. Uh, Todd sent me an email you would like to add to the agenda staffing. It was more to just clarify, um, to get information um, on the staffing requirements of the change to chairing the council meetings. Because there was some reference to need for league, separate legal counsel, additional staffing to help with the agenda and whatnot. So I'd just like to be clear as to what that, what what that, what that was likely to be. Yeah. Yeah, okay. uh, any other things that people have thought about that they would want to add to our decision topic lists? I would refer, refer you to Gail's revised decision topics, and we have put everything on there that I believe was from yesterday that we had, and I just refer you to that, and then I refer you to, uh, we will work our way through the, the uh, actual document that was provided by Steve prior to that. I just have one question about it. I want to check with Steve. When you did the new draft that we're looking at, did that, did you arrive at that by going through the old draft, the, old, the current charter, and picking up any pieces of the current charter that you think need to be reserved in the preserved in the draft? Because somewhere today, I can't find it now, um, I saw something about the city solicitor in the old, in the current charter, and I didn't say anything about it in the new one. I just wonder, do we need to do that kind of a priority reading of the old one to make sure we've not missed anything that we want to preserve? <coughs> the, the, I think what you're referring to pertains to the solicitor of the special act that is listed in the charter. Um, there are, I, mean, I, I, might as well, I might as well just say this now. There are 100 special acts, about 100 special acts applicable to the city of Nottingham that go back to the 1850s. Each one of them has to be analyzed. That's not an exercise that this committee can, can take on. It's, it's, it's a technical nature, it's not policy, <coughs> and it's very, very detailed. We have to work on it with the city council and the city clerk after the committee is, is, is done with what it is. But if some act already made its way into the actual charter that we're dealing with now, then you're saying that that's something that we have to no. deal with? No. 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 Would, would that include, I, I read in the old chart about almoners, uh, council of almoners, all of these are being Do those even exist or do they have a already? They exist. Um, I think the almoners exist only because of, <coughs> it's because of a will. Correct. And you know, I don't know if I would ever, ever find the will. I mean, maybe it's very, you know, maybe it's, it's, it's readily available. But um, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of digging we have to do. To, uh, to analyze every one of these things to see if we can just get rid of them. Um, and, and that's just going to be another task we'll have to do after this after this process. Yeah, I started actually doing what you were talking about with the 41 or 42 sections and have them by headline just so I can uh, refer to them. And then I'm checking them off as we put them into here just so I'm just trying to make sure what gets dropped or what's missing or what goes where, so we can ask Steve the question, of, again, is that a charter issue or a code issue or an ordinance? And um, I would ask you all to kind of, you know, be an extra eye doing that as well. But I try to review the original charter and those 100 acts just to kind of make sure that we're all on the same page. I welcome Bill uh, Merrick. We just started, so we didn't miss anything. We're reviewing, I, I acknowledge Gail's work on the updating this list. If you see any other agenda items, um, Todd wanted to add the word staffing under the city council one, and I was checking to make sure that we did get everything on this one. So, one other thing that I think that we should do is to make sure that before we finish, we've gone through each of the um, emails we received from citizens who have uh, made suggestions and determined whether or not it's something that uh, is appropriate for the charter, if we're interested in it, or if it should be deferred to the ordinance. And Mary was good enough to combine all of those and send those as part of the packet. Yeah. And I have actually done exactly that, but I would recommend that everyone do that as well. 
to make sure if there is a point of view in there that you'd want to share. I'd like to recommend, if we can, that we take each of those and do a little um, paragraph in our narrative so that each person who made that kind of a suggestion feels responded to it and knows that we have Listen to considered it. it. Doesn't that give them unequal treatment to people that came to the forums? What? Doesn't that give them unequal attention to people that came to the forums? No, because I think we're handling a lot of the forum issues. I mean, we could go back over that okay. as well, but I think we've got a lot of that in the big issues because we focus on the big issues. Just to clarify, so the, a lot of the letters did deal with forum issues. They weren't here, but they wanted to talk about term limits. Do we need to respond to each one of those, or is no, no, I don't think so. I think yeah. just the ones that that bring up the yeah. separate, separate others. I understand. And when you say respond, are you responding to those people in, by name or no. responding by topic? I would do it by topic. By topic, yes. Okay. Just want to make sure we're all on the same page as to how we delineate those. All right. I also want to acknowledge the email that Mary sent around this afternoon. Uh, actually, at eleven fourteen this morning. Uh, which talked about the Board of All the Nurse Assessors Health. These were answers to the question on um, what are the, the four that the uh, City Council appoints. Besides the City Clerk, they have those four boards that you see listed there. Okay? Do we have a hard copy of that email? I uh, do right here. Yeah, because I didn't have access. Okay, sure. Please do that. Thank you. Uh, but those are the uh, five positions that the city council has sole authority of appointing. The rest are um, uh, originated with the mayor and then move forward through the process on different slates that way. Any other follow up business from yesterday? I think that we've covered all of this. All right. So yesterday we were able to get through mayor and most of the city council piece of it. Um, since you were all here, I'm not going to review it. Uh, it's, it's captured on film. I will uh, try to update Mark uh, to, before tomorrow's meeting, get him just up to speed on any of these. And see if there's any area he wanted to revisit. Uh, I think we're up to school committee, or is there a list on here, Gail, that you felt we didn't deal with? We did talk about term limits for committee members, and we didn't talk about the Housing Authority, Smith folk, and we wanted to talk about staffing to finish up on City Council. Did we do how committee appointments are set? Set in the agenda. Are the, and the BP fees, we actually, did we come to consensus on that? The last thing we voted. Yeah. We didn't talk fees. We did not talk about fees. Okay. I thought we I thought we disposed of term limits very vociferously in general. With one passionate member going crazy. <laughs> My name is David. There's things I'm crazy about. Um, I, I think there was maybe a sentence or two just assuming that we were going to it is in the new language it's of the new, charter. Right, so I think that's where we really stop. Okay, so I would just refer you then to page one of the uh, template that Steve put together, and it talks about president and the vice president um, of each municipal is provided in. The members shall elect among its members the president or vice president who will serve a two year term that actually be two years. Um, and then it talks about the powers and the duties. Now, the powers of the president, we talked about before, but just to make sure, shall provide, preside over the city council meetings, regulate his proceedings, appoint members to the committees. The president shall have the same powers to vote upon measures uh, as any other city council. The president shall perform the duties consistent with the office. The vice president shall provide in the absence of the president. Now, do we need to add in there those four? Because it talks about pointing the clerk, right? No, it doesn't. Clerk of the council. Does it say that? Or no, I'm sorry. That is the idea. Yeah. That would, yeah. Be in, um, that would be appointment of the city council, which would be on page five. Okay. 
Okay, so that whole five, and you will write that up for us. So if we want to retain those, okay, those, those boards, five, as, as council. All right. So let's start with any updates on the presidency or the vice presidency. Are we comfortable with the wording of it as is, is originated in that section? I should put my glasses on so I can look at nuances. Todd, why we just sort of address part of what was in Mary's email, which is the appointment. The other issue was expenses. Can we look back and go ahead and? There's that closet that was um, introduced, um, allowing for expenses. They're not currently part of the chart. And where are you referencing? Uh, page three, um, line ten. I thought you struck that. Oh, do, we did bike vote to struck it. I thought we okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just and people are comfortable that that is gone. No. Yes. You talking about the last sentence? Yes. Yeah, last sentence. Yeah, I think that that should be part of the council rules and orders, and I don't know that it should be. A charter. It should be charter. Correct. Yeah. And if they choose to create a budgetary item, it shouldn't be in the charter to reimburse themselves. But thank you, Mary, for doing that research as well. She found out that. <coughs> okay. Um, so, re revisiting. No need to go further into President and Vice President. We're comfortable with that wording. And then that gets us into the one, two, three, four, five, six adding staffing topics left in the city council piece. So let's start with uh, fee setting. You want to start there? I don't get why this should be a charter issue. It's not. Sure. If the city council wants to take the power to set fees, they can pass ordinance to do that, right? Correct. Yeah, I would say pot. We there? That was an easy one, Batty. It's not from you. I've not seen any facial expressions from you. I'm sorry. I'm just processing it. Okay. Right. Uh, this was came from Owen. Okay. And Jesse, who right. suggested, and he sent language in specifically to the effect that it should be going to uh, the city council to establish the fees. Oh, I see. James right. Tacey spoke yesterday, okay. having originally agreed with that. He mm -hmm. came back to say that his, uh, upon reflection and talking to the DPW, Felt the issue was far too complex for city council involved in them to leave it to the professionals, i.e., the board. Mm -hmm. so, what, go ahead. so, what you're saying is that we're neither going to endorse that idea nor reject that idea. We think it's an ordinance issue. That's the, the tenor we're going at the moment is that it is not a charter issue. So and whether they assume that responsibility or not would be for them to pick up at a later date. Okay. So, it will not remain the same in the current charter whereby it says that they can set the fees. It, that will just be absent. I believe that's in the special act on okay. Can you please explain? I think that the, the Board of Health, I mean Board of Health, Board of Public Works. Sorry to swing it up with you. The Board of Public Works has been established by a special act. I have not read the special act, but I would I would guess that the powers and duties are spelled out in the act, and it would include setting up the fees. But the council still approves the fees after they're set. I don't know. No, I don't. Think no, at true. this point in time they do not, which is the point that Jesse and Owen um, have originated, so saying have that it should come through the city council for a vote. So they have a unilateral power to set the fees, and Correct. there's no check on that. Correct, and authority. their point. If I remember from the public hearing, was they were concerned it was not an elected official establishing fees. Okay. They set the tax rate was their original point, and uh, it comes from the board of assessors and a recommendation from the that department. And they felt that they should have the same ability to weigh in on that. If I've characterized their argument I, correctly. Yeah, but just to just to be clear, um, Councilor Lafarge was also. Oh, thank you. That as well. Thank you. Okay. I would add uh, Marianne to that list. So if, under the current charter, it specifies that the Board of Public Works sets the fees. Has the final say. Under the new charter, it's not going to be stated who sets the fees. Is that correct? That's correct. And so it would be, the power would be in the council, if the council chooses to authorize the Board of Public Works to set the fees. Or if the council wanted to take on that responsibility, it could set the fees, or it could set up something where it would have the right to approve the fees as recommended. Did I understand that correctly? Yes. Okay. okay. 
and taking a step further, the charter's passed. Yeah. The old charter's gone. Yeah. Where does that leave the, the fee setting until the council decides what to do about it? Well, I would. I think I would treat this this way. I would. I would. There's there's a there's a lot of special acts that set up structures, organizational structures in the city, and I would say until such time as as modified by provisions of section five one, which is the administrative organization provision, that everything stays in effect until changed. Mm -hmm. And the way it's changed now is the mayor. <coughs> excuse me, the mayor would have to submit. And that would be under the new chart. Yes. Would it be possible when we pass this along to the council for them to add language about the, the water fees? And they might. Yes. Yeah, okay. So we're not restricting that, that but right. we can just say uh, they can do whatever they want after okay. they get the document. Okay. That, that was also my understanding. We're, we're presenting a draft, draft. draft to them, and they can slice and dice it any way they I want. Yeah, it's not all over. Okay. But is this one of those areas where? You would recommend that it be an act or an ordinance rather than be in Correct. the charter. So should that be in our narrative, or will you be there to advise the I'll be. Council? I'll be there. Okay. Yeah. So, so I'm not saying this is the case, but if there is a broad consensus that the um, DPW should come up with a recommendation for fees and that the city council should have a power to say yay or nay, by eliminating what there is now, it is a step forward in that process? Would you say we're getting closer to that because we're opening that up? We're giving them not? the possibility for the council to weigh in, whereas we no in. longer have the restriction in the charter. OK. So OK. So it is a step towards that, right. potentially. Towards Towards flexibility. If there's a will for that in the city council, then be easier right. for them to make the change. Right. Okay. Right. And I, I would I would imagine that the um, in, in the council said it that was here last night. Um, it's a very complicated process to set fees of a water and soil. I mean, it's an enterprise fund and that um, indirect costs and cost allocation and it's you know, a it's a it's a it's a huge accounting you know mm -hmm. exercise. Which is what Gene spoke to last night, right. but after yeah. he went through the process, he felt, oh my God, no, I don't want to do this. Right. Okay. So, so we're empowering them to either, to either keep it the way it was or make a change, but they're not beholden to the charter direction. The, the verb is empower. I have a different interpretation of that word. I, I would say that we're no longer restricting them. Okay. Fair enough. For We're removing the restriction. Removing the restriction okay. because it won't be in the new charter. Okay. okay. Now, what they do after this point, their choice. Are we on board with that? Are we comfortable with that? I'm comfortable mm -hmm. with that. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Watching eyes and eyebrows. All right. Uh, so, at this point in time, the charter will not include any reference to uh, anyone. How committee appointments are set. Started on that. Well, we talked about that one. I thought we did. Did we come to consensus? Refresh my memory. I, I don't get that. I might be biased. <laughs> but we took this up. We were talking about the mayor, right? Or we talking in terms of the mayor? Oh, you're talking about right. city yeah. council committee appointments? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> That's different. That's different. But why would we get involved in that? Um, the charter will say in here. I believe, does it not, that you're setting appointments by the city council and the list that Mary sent around today would be the appointments that the city council were to accept. What we're now saying, and, and they also should say not only those five, the four boards and the clerk, but also the city council president has the right to establish who's on what of the committees of the council that they do that. And that should be in the powers of presidency. Is that there? Yeah, yes. Um, so this is another subsection. The council appoints that. Is that Are we comfortable with that list? Should it be expanded, reduced? Is this typically a charter function, or is other in our cases, the council just set their own rules internally and change them at will? 
in, a, well, in this case, it can't change the president's appointment powers of subcommittees. Um, the bigger discussion is the way this, the way this document is, 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 is worded and the, the direction they're going here is that those four boards that are the currently council appointees would be mayoral appointees, subject confirmation of council, just like anything else. As opposed to what they have now, these, these elections where they're having a right. in the a gunfight. And the Board of Almonds. And I mean, right. like, you know, these are, these are, a lot of these things are ministerial positions. Right. Because they don't, you have to have them because it's a will or it's a trust document or something. But they, they, they really don't do anything. I mean, Mary, you said the Board of Health is going through a special act right now? There's a special act that was, that just was submitted. It's not adopted yet. Okay. It what did it do? Uh, it would increase the board of health to five members. Uh, Who would appoint them? Mayor. Let's see if that's the direction they're going in. Right? Might as well keep going in that direction. I thought it was the mayor. And that because that was the same meeting that we had, that we introduced that we were coming to do the charter. Remember that was that fight, that, that discussion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that discussion uh, where the three people who were from the Board of Public Health and several other people from the public spoke to that particular issue and felt that they should be an independent board. And the City Council moved the Charter Act forward, the Special Act forward, with them uh, being in that format. That's my recollection of that. I don't know if that's correct. I can't say that. Okay. Can you explain that? I'm not following. When you say, under the new Special Act, that's recently, I guess, been presented to the legislature for approval. Is that correct? It's not even there yet. It's at Senator Rosenberg's office. Okay. But, it, I mean, it's gone from the city mm -hmm. to the legislature. Under that act, who appoints the Board of Health? We'll have to research that. But no. my gut is that it was the mayoral appointment brought to the city council. For approval. Order tomorrow. Okay. okay. That's the way it should be. But if we... And we do something here that would negate that. Yeah. We could make a recommendation to, to negate that. Not, not, not that overrule it, but just make it move. Well, you don't even have the problem is you don't even have a bill number. You don't even have an act number because mm -hmm. it's Rosenberg's office. They haven't even signed a, a bill. But well, would our charter supersede the, the special act if the charter follows yeah. it? The charter will then supersede the special act. Well, I don't. Uh, I don't know about. Because if the, the if the special act is passed before the charter is passed, you're, you're stuck with the special act as passed. Right. Because you can't repeal it. In this, you can't repeal it in this document because this document won't be there yet. But if we did what that special act aims to do, in addition to the other boards, he then called Rosa Rosa and said, "Hey, can you, just, can you not submit this? We're just going to do it here." Okay. Well, let's do let's the research let's on do, that we'll as opposed to speculating. Yeah. So Mary will bring that for tomorrow's discussion. But you're saying Mary doesn't even have a bill number, right? Okay. Okay. So we're going to take out the one of those three, okay, which is the Board of Public Works. The board, uh, board of Health. Public Health. So the appointments to the City Council will just be the Council clerk. Correct. But we have these. Do we want to include the. I don't have the list in front of me. It's the board of oh, the board of board of trust and assessors. Thank you. What does elected or re-elected mean in this context? Well, this was what we really were talking about council? last time, that, that if it's an election and not an appointment, that you're getting multiple people nominated in front of the council and they argue it out on the spot. Um, and, and Murphy had said that that was kind of a, a ridiculous process that was really fair to the okay. appointees, not me. Okay, why don't we put this whole section then on hold until we get a little more information. Is everybody comfortable with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll revisit this Wednesday. However, we do want to have that the clerk of the council. And I have an acceptable appropriation of clerk of the council and I got a staff. Necessary. That's the word. Basically. So and the other thing with there, by the way, is this. Should we consensus on that and then move on and just leave these boards to be rediscussed later? 
Sure. The other big one in there I want to just note is the assessors mm -hmm. uh, on that list of four, just so we're aware that that is currently in the city council function, and if we're going to make changes of that, uh, for whatever it's worth. Correct? Okay. So we're going to take those on hold. I want to take your point, then I'll go to yours. Do we want to get that off the table, get the city clerk off the table? Go ahead. And we need staff. Yeah. Yes, and when you said subject to appropriation, who has the authority to appropriate? What's the process of getting money to pay for the uh, council clerk and staff? Of the it has council? to be in the mayor's budget. City council that approves. And if the mayor does not put it in the budget, does the city council have the ability to put it in the budget? No. No. All and originating fees have to start with. Uh, all originating expenditures have to start in the mayor's office. And if we're going to a more uh, intensive responsibility for the city council, should the city council have some ability to fund a staff? I throw it out as no, a question. I think it's a good, good question to put out there. And that sort of that goes back to your point. point so go ahead and on that. Nice to know what, what we're talking about. Uh, again, it all loops back to. Well, to, just to, just so you know, the, the, this the, the legislation will not pass anything. Contrary to state law, it's not, okay. not going to happen. Okay, okay, that gets us in one place. In most, in, in most towns, um, with this form of government, what sort of staffing would the council normally need? Would they need separate council? No. Okay. You, never, you never want to have a situation <laughs> where you're doing, doing attorneys in the same building or okay. right? getting paycheck. It's just, that never doesn't work. Okay. Um, and it comes up a lot. I've seen the arguments over and over and over again. They never win. So, because the mayor would never, the mayor, the mayor would never give me the appropriation. Um, most, you know, cities this size, um, a full-time person and maybe a part-time person. And currently, Mary, you're just part-time. Well, Mary does. Mary's job is kind of like a hybrid because she's doing licensing too. So she's basically I'm, half half. I'm half paid by city council and half paid by licensing. Okay. So what you're saying is that you would need one and a half bodies then full time. Potentially. Potentially. But I, I would say that one. I, if, if licensing stays, then one and a half could handle. I think the council and licensing. I hope I'm not. <laughs> well, again, I think that has to be my response to Todd when your email came through um, would be that I, I think that that is not a charter issue. I think that's a staffing issue, just like do we need 500 teachers or 300 teachers. And that's something off our, off our pay grade. And we make the recommendation that we want to have the city council president do this. We recognize the potential for additional needing for staff. Um, or that the city council has to do more work. You no, know. I would just like to have some. Yep, I fully get it. Of that Is it going to cost us more money? I don't know. And we, there's no way we can borrow ahead on that. We can't say it can't cost you more money. It can't be revenue neutral or something like that. So there's no way we can. So I think it could be part of a narrative. Concerns are raised about the extra expense this might cause. Since you're writing the narrative, I'm looking straight at you. Um, you know, I think that that would address your your issue, correct? Well, no, I was literally I was curious. It was raised at, at one of the yeah. forums about meeting council, and so I just I would, what yeah. is what, what does this entail? Right? And uh, it's a yeah. it's a question I think we need to answer before we recommend big changes. That's yeah. all. Well, let's just speculate a little bit. You're talking about additional forty five thousand dollars if you were to raise the cost of the city councils, the extra five. Um, if you were to raise, to add one FTE in there, I'm not going to embarrass Mary and talk about our public salary at this point in time, but let's just say that that's fifty to $75,000 with benefits, somewhere in that range. So you're talking potentially another $100,000 to have a president chair the meetings. That's sort of what's going down this path, somewhere in that range. You know. But that's all speculation. Yes. You know, the mayor's office is not going to, the, the, the work that the mayor's office does right now is not going to go away. It's not going to give it to somebody else. The mayor's office is still going to do all the work they need to do. Just because the mayor's not presiding, I don't think it's going to matter. To tell you the truth. What is not going to matter? The, 
costs of doing it or the, 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 what the mirror does? What the mirror does. I mean, is, is the theoretical just that, that I mean, if the, I mean, so the presumption had been, well, the city council president has to set the agenda, that person needs staff to do that. But you're suggesting the mayor is going to do the bulk of, the, of that same work anyway, and the city council, not the president, is not going to necessarily need additional staff to put the agenda document together. Well, well I, 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 I may argue that maybe the, the city council currently isn't staffed appropriately, even the way it operates now. Okay. Truth be told, Mary says it's right to the agenda. You've pulled in all the pieces from everybody that needs to be there, all the special owners, all the, the things she gets from all the different people that need to have things advanced. And you create that document, and then you breeze it by the mayor at the current time. The mayor and the president will get it between. And why would that change if I should bring the envelope? It wouldn't. So, you know, it, it's, it's a, an intangible. Is it part of our charter decision? Is it part of what we need to do? I think Todd's right. We should consider it. Does it change the votes on how we're going to vote? I don't know. Help me out here, guys. Well, no, it, does, it doesn't change anything. I wouldn't think it would at all. But if, if, as was suggested, you have to hire a separate council, yeah. it, it could. But yeah, if, it, if it's nothing's going to change, I don't think it's, it's sort of a, a non-issue. In my mind, the question is, does what we're talking about doing, does it uh, give the ability to make a change? In other words, uh, or prohibit it. Yes. Yeah, so, well, the way it works now, you have the president of the city council, you have the mayor uh, working jointly to put this uh, agenda together. And that's because, the, tell me if I'm wrong, Mary is the uh, clerk to the city council. Okay. If she, would it be a situation where, um, if the city council sets the agenda, that, <coughs> that there no longer is any communication with the mayor or vice versa in terms of setting the agenda? Is there a potential for that, to preclude the mayor from participating? It can't be that, that would, that would just, that would just stop the city. I mean, the mayor's I know it, it would stop the city. That's not my question. It, it, I mean, it works now because people cooperate. Is there, are we setting uh, an ability to prevent cooperation? That's my question. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think the mayor still has to set, send in appropriation, a supplemental appropriation audit, because that's the way that the municipal finance law works. The mayor still has to send in um, um, uh, uh, transfers from department to department. And the mayor still has to send in um, appointment uh, nominations for the boards and commissions. I mean, there's, no, there's nothing that will prohibit that. Because it says it in the document, the mayor shall you know, send up the names for confirmation. That's in here. It doesn't spell out all the municipal finance laws, but by municipal finance laws, that's how it works. I mean, the, the mayor submits the budget, the mayor submits uh, transfer, the mayor submits, submits you know, we've got all that supplementals, all that stuff. So, and communication. I mean, this is, you know, every agenda of the city council has, you know, communications from his line of the mayor. It could be all sorts of stuff. You know, it's just ceremonial in nature. Bill? Shut me down, this is stupid. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to spend a half hour on it. Um, would it be crazy to not put in stone who holds the gavel, but to put it at the power of the council to decide who gets the gavel? So, in all likelihood, they keep it in the hands of the president. But for some reason, it becomes untenable for whatever weird reason we can't foresee. They could say, you know, this isn't working. We can push it off to the mayor if we want to. You know, he's got a blood vessel, right? That's not a tell. That's not a tell. That's, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go there. Okay, that's, well, just because it's different. Uh, yeah. I mean, either, either you want it or you don't. And, and I think we have to embrace, I think we have to embrace, just for the lack of confusion and the, the what ifs, because when we start to explain this, when we start to get the voters behind this, there's, oh, this, but what if, and then there's the, here's the clause, and here's the thing. I think it's much straightforward to say the mayor does it or the president does it. Fair enough. What's wrong? Yeah. Um, okay, so what, we, what I think we did was we shifted a little bit from the, from the expense issue, the cost issue, into the agenda issue. And I think 
can see that there's reason that we might do that, but what if we try to separate them in Thank the following you. way? What if we say that in the narrative, narrative we would recognize that there could be um, extra costs associated with the structure of the council that we're recommending. The new structure. The new structure. And that those costs would be taken up the same way any costs in the city are taken up. For people to debate the priority needs in light of the full budget of the city. And then put that aside. And as to the agenda, um, I still have a lingering concern about the agenda. And I, and I just want to lay this out here. I trust what you said, that it's likely that business will continue as usual. But with this big a change in a city that's been so used to having the mayor preside at these meetings, would there be any point, or again, it's, it's, it's a bill type question, is this really too stupid to, 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 to um, I'm would, glad that's how synonymous with stupidity is. Please record that. Would it be useful at all to include in the charter that the setting of the city council agenda is uh, to be a collaborative effort between the city council president and the mayor? I think there's, there's enough inference in the document now. Where is that, that inference? Well, at least in community departments um, and in the budget. But what I'm hearing is potential need for specificity, potential need for specificity. I've heard it from two members now. Can I just add, Bill Dwight's comment was the agenda should, uh, as a parliamentary, the agenda should be mandated to include the mayor's proposals. Yeah. Is there any way to? Have a specific language. That was already there, but it is there, right? Where, where in this oh, no, charter is. does it say that the city council president will establish the agenda? All I'm hearing is a simple clause that would go in there under the duties of the, sp the city council president, which would again go back up to whatever that page is over here. Uh, the president shall perform other duties consistent. Right above that line, the president shall set the city council agenda. In consultation with the mayor, and I would throw in the city clerk, but I, I defer to Mary if that's appropriate, just, you know, uh, in a timely manner, just to get that one line, or however we would bolster that, to make you feel a little more comfortable. How about if we, how about if we just deal with it like this? Instead of starting to, to, to dabble into the uh, internal operations of the city council, I don't think you want to go there. Why, why don't we just say, that the agenda, the setting of the agenda shall be just prescribed by the council rules and let them figure it out. I actually think that that's fun, but I'm looking for you two. Because I, I, it would be very interesting, again, I think your rules of engagement, when they set up their council rules and they accept those, and then you swear them in and then they accept the rules, that's the time that you establish all the, you know, protocols, the procedures of how things are done. You put it in there. Now, if somebody wants to use it as a power play, that's another agenda, that's another topic, another chapter. But but does that resolve what you're looking for, or do you want well, more pre prescription? I need to digest it a little bit more. And I think it goes back to my bias that I expressed yesterday. I, and to me, it seems like my position is that I look at the mayor as being a strong figure in the government, yeah. in the governing governance of the city, yeah. and uh, to chip away at what the mayor is able to do as the chief executive bothers me. Yeah. And so, it, and other people may say, well, I think that the council should have more say in what goes on in the city, and want to chip away at what the position in there. So that's that's my uneasiness. I guess. Share your uneasiness. I share your concern. I share your point. Great. And I would just add to that, number one, I fully support the concept that the city council should be able to make its own rules and live by its own rules. The setting of the agenda feels a little different to me in that it's kind of the first time we've split these two um, separated powers. Um, in, in, a, in a traditional way, by having the president run the meetings. 
But those meetings incorporate so much of what goes on in the mayor's office and the mayor's life. This was just a way of putting in writing that the city expects collaboration between these two very separate branches of government. And one way to do it is to make sure that the issues that have to be decided are raised. That nobody stands in the way of raising issues. That, I guess that's where I'm really at. Okay. I'm sure you can do that. Okay. On, on page 12, line 10, it says, the mayor shall, from time to time, by written communication, recommend to the city council for its consideration such measures as, in the judgment of the mayor, the needs of the city require. I mean, isn't that, I guess, things on the agenda? Well, let me throw in then another concept. Page 2, under B, line 3. We prescribe several duties of the president. Again, simple, the president shall establish the city council agenda uh, after direct consultation with the mayor and or the city clerk. I mean, I just, one phrase there. How does that, how, how did, that sort of is a halfway measure, I think. Because you're saying the president shall, the president shall, the president shall, the president shall. Well, all we're doing is that the president shall set the city council agenda after direct consultation <coughs> with the mayor and uh, help me out here with the city clerk only because consultation with the mayor. I mean, uh, well, okay, that's the, 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 the verb. Yeah, yeah, this position might not exist. No, I'm not talking about you as the clerk, but I'm talking about the city clerk because this, doesn't she have a lot that has to come through? Does it gets on your agenda, or am I just keeping that in the back of my mind from the old days of? how this used to run when Wendy was the person sitting there as opposed to you. She does submit warrants and orders sometimes, but then so do planning, so do Okay, so then the, the just, and part of that would also be predicated on whether she remains an independent or appointed authority to me, because if she is appointed and reports to the mayor, then it's the mayor's job to do it, but if Wendy is independent from the mayoral. That's the only reason I was including that person. Just so I'm just playing that out. Steve. I know he is. <laughs> I, I watch his fingers. It's kind of work, folks. It's kind of work. <laughs> work somewhere else. Can the mayor be um, ex officio on the city council? I think the the language that Bill just pointed out. There's a, a member of every body that he appoints. It's the that he appoints, not, not the city council. Because city council members can all bring anything up, right? So if he had a seat. I think making it murky up is not the direction you want to go. Okay. It's got to, you know, you got to just, just go back to my point. <laughs> just throw in the word, sets the agenda, consultation with the mayor. Fine. Yeah. yeah. I, just, I heard you say that, I guess I took what you said, Steve, is that clause that David just put out there that you feel like, well, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'm trying to understand whether you think that that is potentially ineffective or whether you think it's potentially dangerous. Good. Ineffective, not dangerous. But doesn't it give some assurance to voters that the mayor still can get through to the council if relations break down in some way. Isn't that what we're looking for in a certain yes. sense? Mm -hmm. But the, the, the council cannot refuse to, to, to act, to, to abide by its statutory duties. And part of its statutory duties is to pass, you know, stuff the mayor submits. But could they, could the mayor try to submit something and they decide, no, we're not going to deal with that issue? Could they decline yes, to if the mayor, if the mayor, to, the mayor recommends an ordinance, say. The mayor recommends the passage of an ordinance. The mayor can't pass an ordinance because the, the city council for it. But he can suggest passage of an ordinance. And they can say, no, we don't want that. We don't, we don't want to consider it. But can they say, we're not going to discuss it. We're not going to put it on the agenda. It's going to be part of the meeting. They could. It's their prerogative. I think it's a spoonful of sugar that we're trying to put with the right. medicine. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
again, it's folks. It's just an effective, and it, <laughs> and it um, causes no harm. And then there's no, and it causes no harm. Then perhaps it gives the message we're, mm -hmm. we're wanting. Yeah, it's a tenor that we're trying to. Yeah, yeah. expectation yeah. of our branch is working. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Are we, are we comfortable as a team with that? Are we all? I'm watching your eyes. Why are my eyes so I'm not quite a blood vessel over here. <laughs> it's where he puts his hand. It's all tell. I'm not quite sure where we're landing right now. Okay. Landing with recommendation. Uh, uh, under powers and duties, we add that the city council president uh, shall establish or shall set. Uh, the city council agenda after direct consultation with the mayor and the city clerk. No, not direct. Consultation. Consultation. The direct. Uh, excuse me. After, with direct. With. I'm going to throw it in there. With consultation. After consultation. After. With the mayor. And at the moment, I'm putting city clerk in there. I wasn't so sold on city clerk. I don't understand that because I felt like Mary was saying there's many people who might. But those are all mayor, those are all executive bodies, which would fall under. Yes. That okay. seems to when, get a little attenuated. In when, we, when we deal with the city clerk issue, if we decide that that is now an appointed position, then I would take it out. But because it is an independent okay. position, okay. I'm sticking it in. Okay. Just because that's where we're at in the agenda. Okay. Are we comfortable with that, Red? Yeah. Does anybody have uh, any idea, like the sitting council now, how they feel about this? I mean, we're, we're going back and forth, back and forth, and they could go, we don't want it, pull them out. Well, I'm just curious, if, I know how my council feels, and I don't know. Well, Bill Dwight, the new president, in his, his letter in the packet that Mary gave us, mm -hmm. at number four, I have no objection to the council president chairing the council meeting and serving as a parliamentarian, but the agenda should be mandated to include the mayor's proposals. But they basically are not, but as you said, you can't just stop them from, from putting no, it through. No, you said you can stop them. You can. Well, yeah. You said you can, but they probably you, won't. You, can't, you, can stop, you can stop things that aren't technically under the mass curfew. You can't stop transfers. You can't stop appropriations. You can't stop the budget. You can't stop the zoning ordinance. You can't stop that stuff. But if the mayor decides he wants a, a pit bull ordinance, and you know he thinks it's a good idea, and you know, he gets all sorts of press whatever and he submits it to the council the council can say we don't want to, we don't we don't even want to consider this and it, that's that's basically within their purview they're the legislative body the mass making a recommendation and the fact that the three mayors at the meeting we had over on the other side there uh, a couple weeks ago they all thought it was a great idea to separate them I mean they didn't. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any. Didn't seem to have any objections. They kind of. Not David, the new mayor, seemed oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I mean, these very, are smart very, people. They, they, our mayors or were mayors, and they don't. They didn't. Mary seem Ford to was a little more reluctant. She yes. was not. Well, she, was she wasn't. At the first hearing, she was kind of a puff, but then she kind of changed. So was Goggins' opinion changed right. a little bit too. Yeah, so, yeah, there was right. there was yeah. movement by both of them. Yeah, right. absolutely. Okay, are we there on that piece of it? Setting the agenda, throwing that line in there, all in agreement. Fine. I just want to crunch it so I'd like to get through. <coughs> so I'm holding this one out. I've done that one. All right. Uh, right now, term limits for committee. This again, uh, Jesus brought this up as part of his piece. Uh, anybody want to take that one? I don't support any term limits. David Stevens, you do it one place, it's a slippery slope. <laughs> <laughs> Stevens rule, right? <laughs> <laughs> Stevens crazy rule. It's not stupid. <laughs> David, if you speak at the back of him, put your hand like this. <laughs> yeah, I went home thinking I was a little too passionate. Uh, it's one of those issues for me. Uh, as a former elected official, it's just like, no, vote me out if you don't like me. Don't tell me I'm done. Um, same thing I have with uh, electing judges and judges having term limits, too. I don't like any of that. It's, it's, it's kind of good stuff. Are we all on the same page on that particular piece, then? Committee appointments will not all. The committee has to, you have to be reappointed. You have to be reappointed. Be so approved. that's part of the mechanism. Yeah. Just like re-elections, you have to be re- And if 
the city council or if there's a movement that we need fresh faces, so be it. That's the time to do it. Is there a concern historically has this been abused or we have a lot of trouble filming today. That's, that's, it's, it's, really it's, it's really nice when the public gets up and says, yeah, there should be fresh faces, but I mean, we've been having a lot of trouble getting these boards filled. And you know, I just if if we had hundreds of people lined up, that might be a different I still I wouldn't have been. Here. But you know, it, it it's it would be and it, it's way too confident, you know. You can say, okay, I'm term limited on the planning board, so now I'm going to go on the board of appeals. <laughs> but then it has to be specified that he can return after three years, or you know, it just it gets a little messy. All right, how are we dealing with housing authority, Smith folk? What other ones did I have on this list? Forbes Library. They are in the original charter. Smith folk is in there. Forbes Library is in there. Uh, I think Forbes Library is a trust, so you can't. I don't want to get into, I don't want to collect my trust documents, you know, adjust them. Uh, I think the same thing is for the uh, city folk. Um, you cannot do anything about the authorities in the municipal charter. Okay. Anybody have any questions or problems with that? But it, it is state law? I'm sorry, what's the outcome? Yeah, no. Uh, uh, housing authority is not part of a, a city charter. Right. They are and independent they bodies, so they are not included. The Smith folk and Forbes are in our charter. They would the language that is there would be moved forward. Yes. The tr you're talking about the trustees of yes. Smith folk and the trustees of Forbes Library. So right. you will take a look at that language because you currently don't have it in here. So you, you just you? roll it into the here's the, you don't want to disturb that language because it's legal trust. That's correct. And if they in Alpha I'll have to double check, but they both have a special act attached, and when we do the special acts with the, with the city council, we'll retain those two special acts instead. It's a special act, plus it's part of the trust document someplace. Okay. Well, when you say it's a special act, it will, it will, it will become part of the charter, right? Correct. Because you mentioned something earlier about the charter. What I thought, once this charter goes into effect, all the special acts that we have up that amend the previous charter are are then no longer in place. No. Certain ones in the document when it gets through the city council, the document will identify every special act and whether they should be repealed or retained. So there would be a all special to the acts like a, a oh, special okay. act like in nineteen fifty that uh, that changed uh, the uh, the the ward lines. Well that's no longer that's no longer valid. Right. So that stuff is obsolete. Okay, so those that should be retained, shouldn't they be in this charter specifically as opposed to being referred to? He's so, kicking the bucket down the road on that one. He's saying that he will take care of that with um, with the solicitor with and, the, and the clerk and the, and the city council. We've got to run around this. I prefer to deal with most of them here myself, but time is ticking. So. Okay, I understand that, but I, I guess my point is that when this document ultimately goes to the state legislature, mm -hmm. it should not refer to a special act of 1955, chapter 344. That language in that special act should be in the document itself so that everything that affects the charter of the city is all in one piece of paper. That's correct. Okay. So it won't be referred to as a special act. It, whatever the language is will be brought into the charter. What the language, what we'll say is chapter, you know, uh, chapter 562 of the Acts of 1922 relative to um, the boundary of the, uh, uh, the East Hampton boundary. Okay, that's, that's, I'm not even making up, it's probably it's valid. That would be under retained. Now, the, the, the site will be there, but the whole special act is not in the Act of the Because then you're going to have a chart about this thing. Now, the city clerk probably has copies of every special act. It's probably been filed with the Charter, but <coughs> the charter will only identify the, the citation of the act and what it's relative to. They're actually up on the website. Um, I all believe. All of them. Um, I don't know if in detail, but I I was pretty sure that I was reading through most of them. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's that's how I started becoming familiar with them. It's like, oh, and then in 1954 they did this, and you know when they got rid of the the act of the Board of Aldermen and they went from a bicameral 
form of government to, you know, <coughs> that's all in there. Uh, okay. I, I, I guess in, I, I did envision a document that was complete Whole. without reference where somebody had to go search another document to determine what was in our city charter. And I, I guess I, fe I feel that my recommendation is that I would, that's the way I'd like to see it yeah. and when it's ultimately done. What about yeah. just footnote it or something? Yeah, so that it's in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm on the same page with that, Steve. So I, I, we're putting you on the spot on that, but let's just kick that around as to what that means. Okay? I understand where you're coming from. Right. Okay, in terms of the workload and how it does. That's not going to get done. Between now and Friday, and I fully understand. Oh, I understand that. that. No, but I understand. But that. In it, when but the city council, our verbiage when we turn this over to the city council and say, "Now it's your decisions," we hope that you take the language of the special acts and incorporate them into the charge. That's that's yeah, perfect. Yeah. So are we all on the same page? And is that in the same way? I think it should just be one clean document without. Right. You know, Kevin, you're right. You're right. So are we there? And the ones Ready? you're taking out. The ones you and the council and the other people will take out, they'll be just gone to be non existent. Right. Yep. Because no, I agree good. with you. I think it should absolutely be one paper instead of having little sidebar right. things yeah. that you have to go look up on. Out of the and hundred, they're not gone, gone. they're history. Yeah, yeah, I know. Right, right. Out of the hundred it's probably, it's probably 80 that can be just thrown out. Right. right. Yes. Because they're, they're obsolete. Right. right. Yeah. And you'll find special act that will override special act, which will override special act, which I found that to be entertaining as well. So, um, <laughs> And it was hard to follow through, you know, the confusion that would go there. But again, I think that that's something with the city solicitor and uh, the city clerk and uh, probably Mary and you all sit down and say, let's walk through this. Yes. And that will be a fun day. <laughs> all right. Uh, before, before we close this on the um, Smith Road issue, yep. Mary had forwarded an email back in the fall from the department about benefits. Are we, can we address compensation um, of Smith Hope trustees when we're doing compensation? Yes, that because that's all under okay. compensation, elected yeah. officials, because they are elected officials. Okay. All right, so by my calculus, the city council and the mayor sections of the decision topics have been completed. Let's move on to school committee. topic of that, the decision topics, but we can also refer to what's listed in here. The page we are for the 15, 15 is composition. Now Mark had a proposal to add a member, add an at-large. To, to start with the, 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 even though I just raised that, where the mayor is on this, because I think that that changes the composition, or potentially could change the composition. So let's start with, is the mayor a member of the city council, of the school committee as that is now? Talking about, yeah. And does the mayor chair the meeting? Let's start there, and then we'll back down into the other issues. Does that make sense, Todd? You're looking proud. Yeah, no, no, I'm just, I'm so I'm jumping on the agenda a little bit. So let's start there. Where are people with the mayor sharing school committee? Can we just review the feedback we got from that hearing? I think most people supported the mayor being involved. But I, I, I'm not real clear as to you know, sharing versus having a vote. Right. And the biggest dispute I thought was the current vice chair said the mayor should not chair. Correct. And Claire said the mayor should absolutely change. Correct. I thought it was much more split than the city council issue. It's harder for me to parse out the people. Because it seemed like so many people said the mayor should stay in that position because it's so vital vis-a-vis -vis the budget. But then Ms. Peck said definitively the mayor should not change. And I actually had the opportunity to speak to her another time when she was at What was her rationale? Her 
rationale is that it seemed to have a, a, a chilling effect on the committee and that although uh, we have had the good fortune of having mayors who uh, are very much in line with the school committee, uh, it's not guaranteed and that, that it's naive to say that the interests of the school committee and the interests of the city are, are, or the interests of the mayor's office are always aligned. And that, um, yeah, that I mean, the mayor is trying to look at the whole pie in terms of budgeting, and the school committee, you know, their pie is, you know, <laughs> the school committee budget, and they're trying to get as much of the city money as they can, and, you know, she just felt like. Is, is there any rationale for the mayor not sharing but having a vote? Um, you had mentioned before Some that cities have that because I had done that research. Yeah. 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 Steve, could you um, this kind of feels to me like some um, like a hybrid or something in between um, the mayor's office and the city council. I mean, the mayor's office and the city council are sort of clearly separate branches of government. But the school committee feels like it's a part of the executive branch, but I'm not sure I'm right. Okay, can you sort of help place it in, in, in this um, sort of gradient of independence? Well, I guess in the hierarchy of elected officials in, in a municipality, it's made up of the council, the school committee, the school committee doesn't really hear that. But, um, so, the, the, so the dynamic of the mayor being on the committee but not being chair when the mayor is elected citywide and you know is the chief executive of the city, I think the mayor, most mayors feel uncomfortable going to school committee meetings unless the chair. Um, that's just from the mayoral perspective. And that's maybe not the school committee perspective, but that's the mayoral perspective. Um, I think you have a mix in Massachusetts about whether there, there, like, there are there are there are, there are instances where the mayor is on the committee and not the chair, but the majority is, 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 the, is the chair. Um, but it, 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 school committees, you know, you know, were set up back in who, who knows when. Um, and, and they're kind of, kind of, I don't know how to explain what, what, because they're not really legislative. Mm -hmm. And the Ed Reform Act, really transformed the school committee's powers and duties and pretty much set them as broad policy in budgeting, but empowered the superintendents tremendously to make all appointments. The school committees to make all the appointments even to the, even to the, the cafeterias. Um, and then it became kind of a little out of control and, and they just they took it all back because of the, the politics of getting jobs in the school department in, in many bigger cities. Um, so, I mean, their the role has been significantly curtailed. Um, doesn't mean that they're not still important, and there's an important body, but, you know, the, the state, you know, has pretty much taken, taken control um, through the Edge Reform Act. No, I think it's Pat Darkett's point. Yeah. yeah. The Edge yeah. Reform Act changed the dynamics of the role of the school committee. So, is <coughs> in consent pretty much now, or um, just trying to understand Pretty much. And then, and then obviously the most important job is to you know approve the budget and appoint the superintendent. And the superintendent does everything else. So you have currently set this up that they would elect their own chair as opposed to the mayor chairing it. The way it's currently written. Mm -hmm. Are people feeling comfortable with that, or do they want to retain the mayor as chair of the committee? I would argue for keeping the mayor as chair. Um, I find it strange that you treat the mayor as some sort of you know, bastard child getting in their way. That the mayor is the only citywide elected official that comes in with a clear mandate from the public. Um, an at-large school committee member does not come with that same kind of mandate because those elections are not terribly rigorously contested. 
Um, so why shouldn't the public have a place at the, a strong place at the table in those discussions? I, I just don't see what's, I mean, it may not be fun. <laughs> if it, other school peers might find some tensions with that, but I don't see that as necessarily being a negative thing. You still only get one vote. Right. Daddy? Yeah, I'm leaning that way, but I, 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 I'm leaning that way, but, you know, it was, it's a difficult decision considering, you know, we tried to take feedback in that special meeting from people who were really on the inside, and that was so clear. Todd? Well, the, um, I guess the point from the feedback we got um, was Mary Ford's point that she wasn't particularly interested in, in school committee until she had to share it. She learned a lot and it informed her her ability to sort of run the city because that's where such a big chunk of the budget comes. <coughs> and um, so it sounded like being having the mayor at that table involved heading it is important for the mayor's function. Um, and I also want to just take Bill's concept if if the mayor doesn't chair and the school committee can elect their own president, what's keeping a ward member who's been elected with 800 votes from sort of exercising control over that committee in a way I think that would sort of alienate voters if, yeah, if, a, if, a, if, a, ward, if a ward person who doesn't represent the entire city controls the agenda. Especially when you think about the contentiousness around closing a school or whatever. Have a very broad view of those things. Mary Dennis Chen Committee. Yeah. Agree. Agree. Yeah, I think we have consensus on the issue then moving forward. This will be rewritten to include mayor's chair. Now that directly impacts obviously the vice chair that they would elect, the language would then be adapted that they would like to have vice chair to act uh, when the mayor is not there. Got that far, mm -hmm. and um, then that goes right to the uh, composition issues. All right, are we? Uh, Mark's proposal again was to add uh, to break ties or something along that line. He's concerned about that piece of it, and you remember the discussions we had in that. Right now, there are nine people. The mayor is a voting member, can break a tie, so it's five four. It, it does exist with you or do. Right? No, it's no. 10. It's, 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 it's 10. Right. So it's 5-5. Five, five. Um, and Mark's point is to add another at-large person um, to, uh, or the, con the converse would be to take away an at-large person, but to add an at-large person. But Stephanie picked up the meeting, did not like the idea of taking one away. Right. That was test point. So do people want to weigh in on that? You know, the fact that they had two at-large people, they had two at-large positions open, and two people ran for them, and they both got elected. <laughs> and then in my ward, you know, somebody resigned in city council, and we had to practically go door to door begging someone to step into that spot in a special election. You know, school they, committee, you said city council. School committee, I'm sorry. And they won by, you know, they got 11 votes or something, you know, and then they weren't contested in the general election. I mean, I think that this issue maybe ties into the term of school committee because um, Stephanie did say that four years maybe it's depressing the vote. And, I mean, in terms of the volunteers for the position, excuse me. So the idea of adding another at-large position when we can barely recruit to just take papers out, it is concerning to me. To take the, the oh, Greg, go ahead. Is it possible to make the mayor, she can chair the meetings but be non-voting? Then you got your odd number, you got you got nine. Which is the way that the city council is running. Right. Um, to take the long view of it, civic participation in school committee at the moment is, uh, or all committees, is 100 years from now, 50 years from now, we're ready to turn it up for today's, going back to Kiel's point of view. So just I just want to broaden that out of saying maybe there'll be another generation of people who want to. Will. Todd? Um, I don't have a problem with a 5-5 a tie. It just means you need six votes to, to break that long down. 
my understanding is there's never been a close vote, or at least not in recent history. And so that doesn't, the, the issue of uh, even number doesn't concern me. It just means you need a kind of a super majority. Ties and loss, essentially, right? Yeah, ties and loss. So. Megan, I saw a reflection from you. Um, Or, I'm sorry. Five, five. <laughs> Keep the numbers of the way they are. Do we hear a major change for that? Okay. Then uh, the composition would be two at large, seven elected by board. They elect a vice chair. Now, the question about terms and the staggering issue. For the others, do we want to go anyplace else? Is yours policy in here? Yours is that more detailed policy. Uh, it, 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 now, maybe 
because the school committee is not legislative in nature, maybe right. it's, it's all, maybe we just, we just want to go with on page 19, start with 13B, and if you have a vacancy, just have it to be, be a joint meeting of the city council and school committee. Which is how it has been before. before. Simple. Yeah. It's, instead of going through the whole, yes. you know, rigmarole of, of what, you know, of of the, of the vacancy of the city council yeah. and the vacancy of the mayor, I mean, this should be a now, simple process. Why is B there? What is I, your A always makes me crazy. So we get rid of it. So don't even make yourself crazy. Okay. A disappears, folks, because that's the number two so gets to be it. there. You see that A is out completely. A is out completely. What at line sixteen? Okay. Okay. So on page eighteen. Okay. Pa page nineteen or er, line nineteen, the runner up to succeed office concept. Through. All the way through page 19, line 13, where it starts B. B so will become an A. Doesn't need an A because there's nothing else there. Thank you. Are we there? Yeah. Read it first. Yep. Sorry. Just check my boxes. would be filled by vote of the city council and the school committee sure. jointly. Okay. Um, and this is currently as, as the procedure is, and um, uh, just to be clear, because I want to make sure, January 3rd, we swore everybody here, January 4th, somebody says, oh, got to go, be transferred to California, that person's appointed for the rest of that. 300 and 500 whatever days it is, right? Just so we're aware that it's for that full time period. Right. To no, no, no special elections. No special elections. And the expectation would be if it was contested, they would go to the alternative candidate, or the council would likely. The council could debate it and vote on that person at that point. But those 17 people, 18 people, who do the mayor would have a vote at that point. Yeah. Uh, would then decide and choose from a, a pool of candidates. And again, we had so much luck getting city school committee people in the past <laughs> decade. Um, let's go with term limits. And this is all getting captured. You know? <laughs> Just, sorry. Um, anybody would like to feel or feels differently about our discussions about term limits in this area. Harry Dunn, seeing no nuances or faulty veins, uh, I would assume that there will be no term limits. Okay, take a breath for a second. We've moved through three big areas. The next one would be the city clerk. Elected, appointed. When you refer to, is that in here? Um, it's not in there. Not in there. Okay. So we would need to add a section after school committee. Um, a bit of history over the last couple of years, we have moved away from electing department heads. The treasurer's office was the last one that we did set, set, say. Um, any discussion in this area? Todd, you want to I'm just, well, no, I'm just I have some questions about the optics on this. Um, is this an issue that we're loath to touch, or is it possible to propose change for the next clerk that would only take effect when the current clerk left office? Um, or are we just stirring up a hornet's nest if we discuss any changes? I don't think we should be intimidated about any hornet's nest we stir up. If we think it's good government, I think we should go there, which is why I had no problem talking about term limits <laughs> in such emphatic terms. Um, if it's good government to you, then I think you should articulate that point of view. Uh, I think you have several options. One is to retain it the way it is and have the city clerk the only other, the only elected department head. We don't elect superintendents. Some areas elect superintendents. Some areas elect police chiefs and fire chiefs. 
This is the only department head we elect. Right? Um, we retain that. We could abolish that and have it as appointed. It could be uh, abolished, appointed with the concept that there's a grandfather clause that keeps the current occupant there throughout her tenure, whatever that tenure would be. So she would as convert she to an appointment? appointment? It could be a, a conversion. And then the fourth option is that we would simply put in there in language we feel strongly or we were divided about city clerk, whatever the language would be, um, and that we feel that this issue should be brought up once there is a vacancy in that position. The only question I have with that piece, because that's originally where I was sort of going, was that by the time you know that there's a vacancy and the time that you're able to get a special act through, there isn't that window. And uh, I would rather have us show our cards early on as to where we as a committee are recommending. Again, city council will have a different point of view, and they'll be uh, lobbying for it in several directions. Just to be clear, if, if, if you want to, you can, you can give the current incumbent tenure, and, and the incumbent can stay in office without running again. Without what? Without running again. Oh, I thought you said right. Until, I mean, for how Until she leaves. Until she volunteers. But she'd be accountable to no one because she got elected and she got appointed. Effectively. That's right. So and she, I, she's effectively in office permanently because right. she's running for contestant all the time. Right. Go ahead. Go ahead. My sentiments are that the, we should not change. That city clerk should be an elected position and should be separate from uh, the mayor's office and the appointment. Just based upon my experience, uh, there's never been a problem with the office of city clerk. It's run smoothly, and it's a very important office for uh, the maintenance of uh, municipal records, and I don't think it should be uh, beholden to a, uh, an appointment. Additional comments? Red. Um, as long as I've ever remembered, and it goes back to Jimmy Faulkner, yeah. it's always been a always been a position very highly held and, and people, you know, the voters there's enough cynicism and bad stuff out there going around. The voters when they vote for that city council or for the clerk I've heard people say, ah great, she's in or he's in. It, you know, it gives them a good feeling the fact that they are able to put that person in and they're not being held and I think what you said is exactly right. Uh, but I think that it should be the way to keep it the way it is now. Not just because Wendy's in there but because of the, 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 the history behind it and Okay. Other opinions? I felt like I heard a lot of arguments, and I didn't find any of them that convincing, truthfully. I felt like the people who lobbied to keep it um, an election did not talk about what Thomas was talking about in terms of independence. They just talked about how good Wendy is, which I don't disagree with that. But I didn't feel like that was a strong argument. And then I, I don't, you know, I guess I'm just, and I didn't really hear a well-articulated position on why to change it. So I would be leaning towards leaving it as an elected position because I think Thomas's argument, when he talked about, and I guess even when other people talked about going into the office and asking for information that was contrary to the mayor or whatever, that they felt like they were getting a really free assistance. Um, I think that was maybe the most convincing, so. The mayor does not have to be appointing the bar. I see what you're saying. You're saying the city council could appoint? <coughs> All right, so then I could say that I, I would be against the mayor appointing because I think that so much of the information, I just know from working on campaigns, when you go in there and you're getting service, you really might be rubbing the clerk's appointer <laughs> the wrong way, you know? And that's a, that would be an untenable, I mean, that's a terrible situation, to have that person be the gatekeeper of information. Wouldn't that apply 
apply though to incumbent council members as well? Just mm -hmm. Except for it's at least a more diverse group as opposed to a single person. I have to say, I don't have a strong opinion. I could be convinced either way. I'm just sort of throwing out some of the things that I was. Redness, are you here? I think yeah. it, I think it has the potential to be the third rail in this whole thing. If people, you know, it, it, and unfortunately, specifically because it's Wendy and she's a big vote getter, people may go, "What are, what are they trying to do now? Get rid of her? Well, we'll take care of that." And all of this stuff goes. Down. I'm saying potentially has the possibility. Yeah. I want to take that concept though and stick it right here for now. Yep. Okay. Table. Only because. Yeah. I just want to put it over here that. It could derail the, the, the thing. I want to know what's good government. What makes sense? Um, what does the city clerk do? The city clerk is the keeper of the records. We found out she doesn't keep all the records because Mary keeps some of her own records. But she's the keeper of the records, the birth records, the death, the death records. She has the vault. She keeps things. She issues the dog licenses. She, she does all. with elections. That's what I found. That's and they're the critical all, And they're own as well. Her own elections, which again, when you went, the, the issue that was raised during one of the hearings was is there a conflict that she is overseeing her own election? And when you talk about the ability to manipulate, feeling the pressure, I mean, I, I sort of thought it was interesting when Wendy brought up that she didn't want to have pressure from her appointing authority as to how she disseminated election rec rec results for information. Well, she could do that in her own election. I mean, if, if you assume that that characteristic could happen, okay. the city clerk could do that characteristic in that own position. And that person is also the overseer of the open meeting laws, is the overseer of all the, the uh, election uh, filings, the, uh, mm -hmm. the paperwork you have to do for your, for your data. So there was the pushback then saying that that should be an appointed authority as opposed to an elected authority because an elected authority, by its nature, starts with a problem, you know, overseeing itself. That that was just the pushback. I'm not arguing. Okay. No, it, I'm articulating. So is it is name different than the office of the secretary of the state, no. No. which is elected? No. And exactly. And there's, there's been some issues around that in certain things. Right. Yes. And, and, and basically, I mean, and we've had two removed in this last cycle. You have, a local, of right. you have a local. You have a local official that's carrying out basic state functions. It has, but probably none, no discretion whatsoever. All the duties of, of a city clerk are prescribed by statute. All. So what does that mean? There's, there's less chance for abuse, or well, there's no. Well, you, you, I guess you, you, you elect people because they're making policy, or they have some sort of discretion. No. But it has needs. In a neighboring city, which you for named, we saw the issue between the mayor and the city clerk. And the mayor was making charges that the city clerk was not showing up, was playing golf all the whole time, and wasn't doing the work because it was elected official. You set your own time schedule and felt that more could be accomplished in that office in a higher professional caliber by an elected official. So that made headlines prior to this last election. So there, there are both sides of that argument I see you know, um, this is an apartment head. We expect him to be there 8 to 4, 9 to 5, 40 hours a week, doing the work on a professional caliber. If they're an elected position, they, they answer to the voters who might not be supervising them as directly as a city councilor, who city councilor would be overseeing them, or a mayor. That's the other side of the argument, just to round this discussion out to give it more... Yeah. So, in recent years, the city's made a decision to have what's the financial office of, what do we call that? Treasurer. Treasurer. Treasurer, and, and, and one other be appointed rather than elected. They, they combine the whole uh, financial system under a okay, CFO. So yeah. and, and, that, and that person is appointed by the mayor. Correct. But, uh, because what I was trying to make, I was trying to look for parallels in the city clerk's office. Where you say there's no discretion, um, still something like the open meeting law requires a lot of knowledge and know-how and expertise. Well, I hope the city clerk's not interpreting the open meeting law. Not interpreting? 
Yeah, that's 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 the city solicitor's job. Oh, we we wanted the city clerk. So, so that's my. I guess this is a question: Is there anything in the city clerk's office that is parallel to the financial officer's obligations in, in terms of needed expertise? Let me turn that question out of your head. The expertise that is needed, can that best be sought out through an election or through an appointment? The right. vote is the best judge. What it is and the vote is the best judge of a person's performance. But do they even know? Or a supervisory body person. We but, just, just but to couldn't you argue that of all the positions in government, that one, I mean, that person is at the window serving the public. I mean, that person isn't tucked away in a back office in terms of the public having a sense of how they're performing. I don't see them as very insulated from public opinion. I think we're working on that. The collector's office has got accountant. Almost every municipal office is accountant. But people come in. So if that clerk was not at the job or if you had to wait, you know, three days for something or if they didn't remind you you needed to submit campaign reports. I mean, to me, I guess I just, that doesn't seem like someone that's hidden away that, that the voters would have no sense if they were just, you know, golfing during the day. I mean, it seems to me it would be obvious to voters, no? Well, let me just sort of hear that thought, but in the budget of the clerk's office is comes through the mayor as well? The mayor has yes. So, All budget. <coughs> so if work isn't getting done, you know, it, there's, there is some supervision, at least in terms of budget. Sure. Oh, no, there's, and again, when we play out the neighboring city, what they ended up doing, because they got mad at the little fight that was caused, they defunded the chief of staff of the mayor because the city council vetoed, which they have the right to do, uh, the chief of staff. So, you know, it, it, it was a very interesting little game that got played down there, but is that the best interest of the city? Well, there's also, there's also that whole, the whole kind of pension issue we have. The person, you know, that gets elected to the city clerk's office is invariably in the city is probably a former city councilor that was making $5,000 a year, then jumps over to the city clerk's office and makes sixty-five, seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a year and retires on the highest level. Yeah, that, that's not the way it is here. Now. The way it is here is we've had, at least in my tenure, four now constant professionals who have done the job and needed to, do, to get the job done. Yeah. So we've been very fortunate that we haven't had turnovers or even big fights. The last fight was the election was Patty, who was at that point the COA director, but she had been the voter registrar going against the assistant city clerk when Chris left. And it was, so it was two people from the same department, they hadn't been merged yet, but uh, vying for their boss's job. The voters decided, put Wendy forward. And Wendy became, it, and Patty stayed at the Council on Aging. So that was the last contested election we had in that race. How many years? That was at least in the last 20 years because Chris was there for a lot longer than that. I think it was 16. 04, was, yeah, 04 was Wendy. And then Christine was there until when Adeline left. I don't know when Adeline left. I mean, it's like it, late 80s, early 90s, somewhere in there, I think. I think the, mayor, the mayor actually controls the budget of the city clerk's office anyway, right? Because I know there was some staff cuts and stuff like that. Correct. So, so it's not like the, the city clerk the city clerk controls all this stuff because right. she, 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 she does won't. I think it's, it's hard to, I, I understand we're looking at one government, but to me it also feels like we're being challenged to, to fix something that isn't broken. In the future, say when Lindy retires in 10, 15, 20 years, could the council revisit that and, and put through a special act um, at that time? Or if they so chose to, they so which was that fourth option I discussed. Okay. Okay. But you're thinking the time for a special act given the Right. That's the only issue with. So we'd be back in the right. exact same. As opposed to the grandfathering or what you call tenuring yeah. in uh, option, which basically says until this person submits their resignation, they would. Uh, so. It is, 
the office of uh, C clerk referenced in your document? Not at the moment. <coughs> have to be created. Megan, you're awful quiet over there in the corner. I'm trying to make up my mind. I, I hear what Maddie's saying about <coughs> not fixing what's not broken. Um, I think that it has worked very well for the city, having the position elected. I, I, but just looking at this government, the way that I think it should work and the way it should be, I would think that it was an appointed position. Being the, the mayor, the CEO of the city, and I just see that as, as part of it. Um, but I also, I, I don't want to shake something up that's not necessary. Um, Gail, where are you? One last question. Um, you know, um, I'm, I'm assuming that there's a lot of literature out there on what makes good government as some expert government experts look at modern government. Is this issue dealt with in any of that literature? I think I sent a couple of things out of our elected person going to that. The Collins Center has come up with a, a chart, you know, to, to help people make the determination. But basically, in a, in a nutshell, mm -hmm. administrative positions, why elect them? I mean, it, it, like David said, why don't we elect the police chief? Why don't we elect the DPW director? Why don't we, you know, it's, that's a valid argument. Why just the city clerk? It's a different type of position. It's a position that retains public records that the public has access to. And I don't, it just is, I think that it should be an independent uh, position. I mean, you go in and there are many things that uh, have to be presented uh, to the city clerk for time uh, purposes. And that person should, I don't think that that person should be a political appointment. Be somebody that is but see, I don't see the school. I'm not saying I'm, I'm against elections. I'm not there. But I'm just saying, just to play the devil's advocate for you, I don't see um, your your point about public records and stuff. Well, you know that that's the police department, the police chief, because there's public records there. There are public records in school departments. There's public records in libraries and councils on aging. There's public records in a lot of places. That's all public. So I'm not understanding that piece of your, your uh, second argument, unfortunately, Tom, if you could repeat it, because it just slipped out of my mind. I had a second argument? Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, uh, I think that the, I, I think it's important that it be an independent position. And, and I can only go from my personal experience in terms of dealing with, uh, and you say, the, the police department, you say the school department, I have any experience with the school department. It's much easier to get information out of the city clerk's office than it is to get it out of the police department. It just is. I mean, that's anecdotal. I don't know why. Okay. I, I guess one problem that I have is that I don't see appointed officials as some sort of beacon of, uh, you know, lack of corruption and Appointed officials are, I mean, I mean, in other communities that I've lived in, I mean, I lived in Rhode Island for years, I mean, appointed officials, they were the worst. I mean, they were under the power of the, you know, the mayor or whatever, they yep. were accountable to no one. Right, but you that, that was, that was actually... To get out of their chair right, come over that, and help you. I that mean, was Tom's point, and okay. I wanted to follow up on that. But I also don't think we have a history of that in this town. No. Okay. I think that the police chief, the, the uh, superintendents, the the um, uh, fire chief, the department heads that have been up there, we have a tenure, we have a good track over the last three mayors, at least in my tenure, that there have been good department heads put forward that have not been political hacks that have done things behind the scene to advance the cause of the mayor. So the argument that all of a sudden if we move this office, which is a administrative clerical function in that realm, that that's all of a sudden going to become corrupt, or it's going to become the you know the mayor's uh, uh, you know yeah, incompetent golf buddy. I, I I I can't buy that. I don't I don't okay. go there because we have always professionally reviewed and appointed the best person, mm -hmm. okay, uh, to move forward and, and to move up. Uh, 
and you've been very lucky in this city to have been coming. It's worked great, and, and, and this is this shouldn't be this, uh, this this argument shouldn't be, you know, reflective uh, around the, the present incumbent. Because, but I know of other cities around here that have elected city clerks that have been a disaster. Can you tell me the appointment process? I mean, is it does the city council <coughs> approve the appointment, or it's just the mayor unilaterally appoints? We would be creating that system doesn't exist right now. You could have the mayor appoint the city council. You could have this as one of that section that we talked about under the Board of Alderers, that, the, that, that you want a wide range of people, not just the clerk doing it, but the city council would actually appoint the clerk. So you could create it in any of those venues. And can we see where people are standing yeah. on this issue? Yeah. Let's start there. Over there. For appointment, that's below the suicide. So if the question is... But we're not talking about political suicide right now. <laughs> we're just talking about the concept and how we get to that concept. If, if, if we live in a world without politics, I would make it a point. Okay, Meg? I mean, uh, Ben? I'm somewhere between stand aside and formal disagreement, but willing to throw with the board. Todd, you got off quiet too. I haven't made up my mind. I mean, I'm having a hard time, you know, not thinking about the 800 pound gorilla in the room. So, um, I, I would like to pursue good government and best practices, but I don't think it's practical in these situations. So that's why I'm sort of torn. Um, can you can you make an opinion though, like? Aside the yeah, if you have to come down to the line, I agree with you. That's, that's the point question that you're, you're, want, you're a, looking for. Yeah. Is if you have to step down to that line, yeah. okay? Do you step on the appointment? Do you step on the elected? Forget about the outcomes, right. the problems, the the 800 rule. Appointment or elected? And, and I one. hear at this point two and a, and a pass from that. Appointed. Am I counting correctly here? Well, we, we keep with it. It's for appointment then. So four, two for appointment, one dancing between the two. I, I can live with it, yeah. I'm, I'm leaning toward appointment. Okay. I feel strongly they should be elected. Okay. Very strongly. Um, I am perfectly willing to accept the appointment. Um, I think it's the cleanest structure for an administrative position in government. Um, but on the grid, I would stand aside if the majority went for election. Uh, wait, I, want to, I, I guess I also want to say, if we went for appointment, I, I would want to grandfather my name. Okay. So I'm okay. confused. Okay. So you are appointed. I'm appointment in a perfect world. That's okay. Right. We're, we're three and one at this point. I'll appointment with grandfather. Yeah, I mean, three and one. Red? Yeah, I'd be for elected, but what she said, I mean, we're really all right. I'm for elected. <laughs> I, I think I'm by uh, for appointed by the mayor. So we're four, two, and one, and somebody's being quiet. Oh yeah, me. <laughs> uh, if we did have to deal with Wendy, if it wasn't a, a Wendy personal issue, if Wendy had announced her resignation a week before this, it'd be so clear to be appointed. Um, what I get worried with a uh, saying uh, that we would go with uh, pushing appointment now sends a message that, of almost a lack of confidence for Wendy, and that's where the grandfathering has to somehow be part of that. I, Gail's point about it being uh, good government, I, I just I don't understand why that office. I heard what 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 Tom said, but I don't understand why that office is different than electing the superintendent. Well, other towns will elect superintendents. Well, I think Wendy made a point in her testimony that, you know, someone called her Saturday morning. She got
got in the car and drove into the office and did something, and or a lawyer came to talk about how you could. That's a personality it. issue, not a clerk issue. Not every clerk is going to do that. That's a that's a person. So going back to but what Gail first admonished us on. But but what going back to Gail's thing, we're trying to make decisions as to uh, what is good government and what is beyond this person. We're, we're setting the charter. We're saying the city clerk is going to be the clerk for the next 50 years, whether it's Wendy or it's person X. And we're setting up that job description for person X, not for Wendy. We've already taken Wendy off the table. So we're setting up a job description for person X. Should that person be elected or appointed? I think it's a terrible idea to give someone lifetime tenure. They could become uh, incompetent for any one of a number of reasons in a short period of time. I, I, I don't like that idea at all. But what about the idea? Where I thought I heard that the last one was that we would not institute appointment until Wendy herself chose not to run anymore. In other words, that she'd have to keep running. This piece of the charter would be That's accepted by the legislature, but wouldn't become um, valid until the resignation of the current city clerk. What if she? What if she? If she had an election, if she had to be still to run until next term of date. Right. And she lost to somebody. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> good point. Then what happens? <laughs> That's a good point. No, no, no. It's, 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 it's as long as she, no, as long as that human being. Is doesn't matter about the opponent getting beat. No, it's matter about the opponent winning. Then what? But then no, then it becomes about the, appointed. No, 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 no. Then the charter becomes the, the charter. So why win. would anybody run against her? Because if they won, they wouldn't, they well, wouldn't exactly take right. the position. That's exactly right. right. So <laughs> well, it's now. I'm I'm really all part of the purpose. Well, well, but, but you could set it up to say you could set it up to say that Wendy would would be there. Uh, she'd still get elected every two years because she spoke to be two years, not four year cycle. But she'd get elected uh, through that period. When that office, um, oh yeah, you're right. It doesn't work. Never mind. Never mind. I took myself down the path. Megan, you had your hand up. I want to go to Megan because I just she's the quiet one. Question um, uh, about the last two times North Carolina tried to pass a charter in the 70s and 90s. Is this the issue? That uh huh. Both times? One of the times, a lot of the time they didn't get the signatures to get it on the ballot. They failed at that point. It was the 1973 charter issue. Pat Goggins spoke to that, and that was there was a strong uh, clerk who at that point in time stood up and said that. Um, I don't think that having the position elected is bad government. I'm completely fine with Northampton being quirky in this instance, and Tom uses the office and way more than I do <laughs> than there was. Um, so I, I'm I'm comfortable as well, and my understanding is if there is a problem, if Wendy, something happens to Wendy and her replacement is horrible, the council could step in and do a special act. Well, what happens now if, if there's a vacancy in office? What does a special act for the city clerk? I don't know. It's like that for the rest of the term. It's not unprecedented, right? When there's a vacancy in office, you mean the actual appointing? Yeah, by the way, just to the end of the term. And it is a sort of, it's what's happening with register, help me out, register deeds, is that what we're doing? Who's the, who's the, uh, I think the state office. Secretary of State. Uh, yeah, but I'm just saying that oh, there's Ames, Ames is, yeah. is there um, until the register yeah. program. Okay, that's a, that's a two-step process. Okay. Where um, there was um, a very temporary appointment until the governor decided to act to fill the rest of the term. Yeah. Governor, in this instance, acted with that um, nomination. Was that approved? Right. Um, the governor could fill that slot until the end of Sully's term. Yeah. Um, and then that term ends at the next election in 2013. Okay. Or be the election. Okay. Where are we, Patty? I would just say, I want to read. My disagreement with it to say that I guess I have a general orientation towards um, a distrust.
have the, the executive power, and I am comfortable with uh, having that be an elected position because I am not interested in giving more power to the executive branch. Okay. Most of the city. the council can step up and through a special act change to appointed clerk. They can do that at what, any what, what point in time. Any point in time. And what's the, is that a long process? Is it, it, what's the risk of? You have to pass it through your city council. It then goes to find your champion, your state rep, your state senator to advance it in their chambers. Usually special acts are put forward on days when there are no, um, what do they call them, informal sessions is what they're called. And they put them forward in informal sessions in their, their pro forma. They, just, they have one a member of the Democrats and one member of the Republicans there. They champion through things and then all it takes is one person to stand up and say no. Then it goes to the full piece. But usually those things go through that quickly. And they we're talking about our months or? Uh, uh, some of them take a long period of time is that the special act of this Port of Health, if I remember, was back <coughs> in October when I think that discussion went down. I could be wrong, and it is now January. But Stan has also been in the hospital, so I mean, there's reasons why that might not be on the timeline that I'm thinking. I don't know. It could take three, three months. Yeah. I would suspect that because it's a special act, the, the legislature is deferring to the municipality, and if there was an emergency, that uh, there might be the ability to get through a special act a little more quickly. Just to put on the Wait, what happened? Sorry, go, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. You go ahead. We're talking about an instance of something, of her being unable to serve, or them just hating her. I She's elected. They can't just go well, in there and say, that's it. Never mind. No, no, no. What I guess I was thinking about is... Well, I mean, you don't want to encourage <laughs> that, though, right? <laughs> well, well I, they can do whatever they want. Well, they can do whatever they want. My, my concern was if we stay with an elected and then her replacement is incompetent and so, or deemed to be incompetent yeah. or is failing the city, the council could always step in and through a special act move to a, decide we don't want elected anymore. We want appointment. We've had a very messy process. Yeah, because that person's popular. Or for the next the next election. Well, yeah, that person's popular. Person that person's presumably... personally popular yet doing a horrible job. <laughs> 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 yeah. Council might be in a big... So, so that, that I was going to say before is in terms of vacancies, if I, if I Googled the charter accurately, um, a vacancy now the council appoints the remainder of the term. The vacancy of what? The, 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 the vacancy of the clerks. Council fills it. And then we have to go through the whole incapacity issue, I think, with that position as well. That a lot. That yeah. I mean, I mean, most special acts are very simple little things for one person or one family. Am I right about this? Is that? Well, special acts can be proper through this whole child is a special act. Oh, okay. But I guess what I'm concerned about is um, I've already said I will stand aside for a, a majority that wants to elect. I, I'm, I'm not that um, worried about this particular issue. Um, but I don't want us to fool ourselves that if we um, don't, ta if we fail to tackle it here, that the, that the city council can tackle it in a special act sometime down the road in some no, easy no. way. I don't think it'll be easy. Um, because it's about, the ch it's about a charter level issue. Um, so I don't think it'll be easy, and um, I think if we vote for election, we're voting for election for the very long foreseeable. Uh, is, is there anyone who wants an appointment, who thinks it's really important that be appointed, that be appointed? Excuse me, I'm sorry, I missed that. Is there any one of us who's on the appointed side of the fence <laughs> think it's a priority issue, that it's important to fight for the fact, even if it's contested, it's, it, it's so good government that we have to do it. 
That's not where I am. It's not where I am either. And I'm not even, I'm more in the middle. I could go either way. I'm talking about something either on either side of this argument. I know the folks who are for the elected are fervent about it. So just in the interest of time, yeah. <laughs> if we're not that fervent about it, we just call it off. I, I'm going in that direction. But that's, but that's two things in favor of election. Because the issue that you put on the shelf behind you, you know, the political issue, still does move. And the other stuff that we've already decided, and it's going to be some of the stuff that we have to go, um, do seem like crucial issues for a city's future. And I wouldn't want to jeopardize those by one that we don't feel strongly about. I, I think that I could tolerate you know, some type of protection for Wendy and then going to an appointment by city council, because I see that as different from appointment by the mayor. However, so that's, you know, I'm not saying I'm really for that, but I could certainly, I can live with that. But then going to the issue on the shelf, I think that it's going to be, um, I think that we have to be realistic about what we can explain to people also. And if we say, it's a change, but it's not like this, and it's not like that, and she'll be there, I, I just feel like that, you know, you could have like a pretty elegant solution, and it, it, it might be too hard to explain to people if it has different. Have they ever discussed this with the president incumbent? Yes, she's, she got up and spoke. She spoke. No, I spoke, I said, no, you spoke. One more. Oh, one and one. Okay. No. Maybe something should be done. Well, I did, and I, I uh, did want to go there only because it, I felt it was a private conversation. Oh, okay. Do you think that? Um, to, can I? Go ahead. Let me just take this a different way. And here's the piece again. I take your point about saying, Tom, you use these. Good point. Do you use any that are appointed, and do you find them to be more or less problem? Okay, I don't know. If more or less problematic than an elected, are we appointed ones be problematic than the person gets fired? I would assume. Uh, Someone spoke though to that point, an attorney who said they traveled to various towns and Wendy's friend that she brought in. <laughs> 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 Would you elect which departments would you, you know, and where would you, you know, I would yeah. automatically say this is an appointed job. That would just be where I'd be. But we have a 200, 350 year history of the Northampton. We have 130 years of this charter. Um, what's best given some of that? Throwing that in with the balance that we should be looking at. So I'm having trouble with this one. This is not one that comes down easily for me. I don't think that it's a in, in my mind, it's not a personality uh, decision at all. And it, what I'm sensing is that, for, for whatever reason, there are people that feel that this is good government to have this position appointed, but they're they're not perfect. I mean, they don't don't really care one way or another. And it, when it comes down to it, it's not that important of an issue. And if it's not, I think that by going to an appointed position, we stand the, the, the chance that the, all these efforts are, are going to go down the tube because the charter uh, won't pass. And so I think that that's a, 
and for so that was that was Pat's position too. Yeah. I mean, if that's if that's the case, then uh, I say let's make a decision or try to reach some type of consensus and move on. Because I, I'm concerned that uh, we're, for whatever reason, we as a group feel that uh, we have to consider this as being a, an appointed position and recommending that. Consider recommending that, not necessarily making that decision. Uh, recommendation, but we have to give a lot of uh, thought to this position, uh, this determination as to what we're going to do. And, uh, but nobody feels real strong about it, one way or another. I realize Mark's not here, but he does feel strong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> this, uh, if you read his paragraph. And what, where is he on this? He's on um, uh, appointment. We have been discussing this for 27 minutes, I believe, if I've been watching the clock correctly. Uh, I'm going to take one more spin around, and uh, I, you get to say one word. Appointed or elected. I don't want to hear any of the other 800-pound gorillas. I don't want to hear that I'm a wishy-washy or I can live with it. I want to hear one word. And this oh. is with the issue off the sh back on the off the shelf. Off the shelf oh, about yeah, Wendy, tenure, oh. all that kind of stuff. Appointed, elected. Appointed by whom? Uh, well, just appointed, and we'll we'll <laughs> appointed, elected. Go. <laughs> one word. That's all that comes out of your mouth. One word. Are we voting? No, I just, this is not a vote. It's not a vote? It's not a vote. use the gradients then? Because... I hear you. I just, I just kind of want to get a little better direction on this, because I think this will help us. Okay. One word. Elected. 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 See, I knew we could. <laughs> <laughs> you just... <laughs> you throw in the options it takes to bring them on. Okay. <laughs> Elected. We are going to have to ask our staff person Sorry. to write the language <laughs> in it. We disappointed her. <laughs> 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 graduate school public we policy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you could write, write up the far, language, but... the article that we will need, and the section that I'm we will kid. need, that will talk about city <laughs> clerk, <laughs> the election of the city clerk, um, um, we're the, talking the two-year term, term. Two -year term, everybody were there with two years, which is what Wendy had requested personally, but I think we're going to keep everybody there except for the mayor. A two-year term, um, and we'll, we'll come back to that position when we talk about signature requirements and or compensation, because that is an elected official. So we circle all back to those issues at different segments of this agenda. So, two-year term, city council. No, two-year term city clerk. Yeah. Uh, vacancy is how? City council. Yeah. Okay, city council appoint the vacancy to the next municipal election or special election? Current charter will still expand on the term. For the, for, for the balance of the next five. Yeah. Okay, we there? Make it That's fine. Okay. Balance it. So that could be, again, a year, year and a half. Right. A year and a half. Right. So as long as we're all on that same page. Mm -hmm. Uh, any other segments of that that we need to worry about? Uh, we just need to figure term out. Term limits. So clerk no, I, term limits, yes, no. No. No, no. no. no term limits. Just asking. Okay, I think we've hit all the... But we need to add it back into the, um, to the, to the sentence we added about agenda. So the clerk is elected, yeah. so the clerk needs to be So the agenda is on that page two. Okay, page two, uh, B, powers and duties, shall set the agenda in consultation with the mayor and the city clerk. Okay? Keeping this track of hand. One more ball in the air. Let's go. Okay. I think we're good. I think I'm very comfortable with that outcome. Um, you're writing that up, by the way. Okay. Okay. Only because that was the original head was going at the court date, but that was your original head volunteered to write. Not much to write. Not much to write. Well, no, I think. I think. Yeah. Send me your paper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I also say. Well, I. Did,
just want to say something. I think in, um, in, in fairness to uh, the discussion, I'll, I'll present it. Yeah, right, right, right. right. Well, I, I, think, I think, again, that was uh, uh, Barry's point of view of making sure that we have, when we write these position papers, that we show the range. We just don't push one opinion. We show a range of what was said. And I think this is a good way of that we work through consensus for a half hour. We talked about it, we talked about the implications of it, and we have decided to remain it as an elected position. Okay? And that, I don't know if you want to use a vote, but it was a consensus agreement. And it was fairly, I mean, it was unanimous. So we're there. We we'll change with Mark, but okay, we're there. Moving forward. Oh my God. Hi. I haven't even done with page one yet. Uh, elections is the next thing on the list. And under here, we were looking at the hot topics here were preliminary signatures and IRB. I'd like to take IRB right off the top, which is the, I, this is my first choice, this is my second choice, yada, yada, yada. Everybody there? Take that discussion first. Anybody want to start that conversation? Uh, can I hear more about this option that we would put something in there asking for a study. special study or something, can I hear what that's about? We would not put it in the charter. Okay. We would put it in the submission of the charter. Okay. These were issues that we felt needed to be discussed at length over a period of time, mm -hmm. including instant runoff voting, and that we would suggest that they set up a special commission and take a look at that. Okay. So it would not be a charter thing. It could be, because you suggested that things like that could be put in there, mm -hmm. but I would not do that with this. I would say that this is just an investigator that, that there was, what I heard that night, where there are a lot of people who spoke in favor of it, no, everybody thought it might be a poison pill and uh, don't push it with this charter. That's what I, I heard that I night. heard that and also, you know, when I looked into it at all, I just thought that I didn't feel like we had the expertise to even parse it out. Cool. But I did think that there was significant interest in it and anybody that I have spoken to, they say, oh, that's the thing where right. blah, 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 and there seems to be a lot of interest. So I would curiosity like to... Curiosity factor. Yes, a curiosity. I would like to plant a seed, you know. I'm with Maddie. I think the uh, articles that Mary sent through that talked about the technical issues with the machine, talked about problems in San Francisco where they have 17 candidates for <laughs> there. Um, I, those are all things that I'm not sure how valid those issues are, but I think, again, punning this to the council, having them look into it, I think it's a great idea, but you know, it may not be practical in the term. Tom? I don't have an opinion on, on the process of, of the instant runoff voting, but uh, is that something that would ultimately end up on the chart? Is that how, if the sometime in the future it was decided to the charter would have to be changed because so be it establishes election. the way of elections are being conducted. Right now, the charter would have a preliminary election and a regular election for municipalities. We would then change it to an IRV, which would uh, eliminate the preliminary. I'm not in favor of putting it in this charter at this point. I skipped you not on purpose, but by accident. Make, make it a study. I agree. Red, I know this is one of your favorite topics. I don't want it in the charter either. <laughs> Study. Okay, so if the minutes could reflect, just to catch you up, that the concept of IRV was debate, uh, vetted, and that we have put it as a formal request that the city council should establish a study commission to uh, uh, investigate. Explore. Explore, thank you, that's the word, but it'd be better. Explore instant runoff voting. And down in states like Oregon, um, I have an in-law who lives in Eugene, and they can vote by phone. I mean, there are all sorts of new ways that people are voting, so maybe we can expand mm -hmm. that method. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's just throw that out there. Anyway. Yeah. And from Oregon, it's all absentee. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> That's great. All right. Uh, preliminary elections. What did you do with this? You were trying to get rid of it because you don't like preliminary elections. I don't like them either. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you get rid of it, you got a question. But without the IRB, we don't have yeah, We need preliminary elections. Or we just have a plurality. Yeah. No, 
I'm going to be moved on this. Thing. <laughs> I mean, typically, we, typically we take out the creative and runoff stuff. Typically, if you don't have a primary situation or a preliminary, and so it doesn't get 50 percent, then you have a runoff. Or you traditional one, you have a second election in December or something. Right. Uh, unless you leave it as a plurality. Right. Uh, I would agree with with David. I think, I think plur a plurality winner is an untenable thing. Um, you know, I don't care so much whether it's preliminary or or runoff winner as long as the final winner has a majority. But uh, this is a big enough issue to warrant a change. So the current system would be, if, say for mayor or any office, if there are more than two candidates, you'd have to have a preliminary. Mm -hmm. As opposed to a you put it all in? You put all the preliminary stuff in? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> I had just put a footnote when I elected the non five <laughs> just to put the seed in. Refresh my memory, the advantage of a preliminary versus a runoff after the fact? Just the title. Well, the prelim, right? The prelim. I mean, it does the same thing. Top two votes. No, but, but in some circumstances, you would need to have a runoff because you right. would have five candidates wanting to get 51% okay. beat up in. I, I think preliminary elections discourage third candidates, and I think they favor incumbents grossly. And I think there are minority candidates who would take more time to get their campaign off the ground, and they could have increasing support if they had more time to run. So I think they're, they're, they acutely disfavor minority parties, and I'm opposed to them. And, but are you opposed to 51%? No, I'm not, because okay, so I you think would do a the runoff afterwards, runoff. Okay. give the man or woman a fair shake at it, and then, you know, let the cards fall where they may, and if we need to get to 51%, fair enough. But let the person run for the course of the campaign time. And then the major election. Yeah, right. And if, not, if they don't achieve 51%, there would be 50 plus 1, there would be a runoff right. held within X days. Okay, of the right. Two hours. The two complaint that people say that there is a complaint now, similar to what you're, you're saying. Uh, someone gets a handful of signatures, has no shot. You got to run the preliminary and spend the money on it anyway, and it's kind of a waste of time. Right, in, in, um, so in the traditional runoff situation, you just go straight to election day. That guy's going to lose, <laughs> and you're done with it. Uh, and uh, you didn't spend any more time, you know, giving them a spank as a loser. Right, right. Uh, if that person is a spoiler and drags the, the top person down to 50%, so be it. But um, there's less of a chance you have to run two. I guess the con to that would be that if everyone participates in the general election, then even the marginal candidate participates in debates. Right. But there could be wonderful. That's democracy. I mean, I don't even like talking about marginal candidates. I mean, I don't even like that term. That's not for me to judge who's a marginal candidate. Put them in the debate and let the voters decide on voting day. I mean, I, I, I. other opinions. you say it's not up to you to decide if they're marginal candidates, it kind of is, isn't it? I mean, if you see three people out there and one of them is, you know, just doing it for basically to do it, um, he, I would consider him a marginal candidate. I wouldn't have a problem thinking I'm that. I'm saying in a debate, though, Rod, I mean, <coughs> who's to, why, would, why would we block someone from a debate? I just, I, I don't see the argument. I'm not because saying to do that. I'm, I'm just saying, saying one saying man's marginal. marginal candidate is another man's you know, I agree with you. speaker of truth. Yeah. So to me, a marginal candidate is someone that's running with a lot of corporate backing. Somebody else's marginal candidate is someone from the senior center. Well, and, and, you know, I, I mean, that's just yeah. not fair. Right, and I mean, they shouldn't be stopped from speaking and so but forth. They but you are can still look at them. It's election because somebody who doesn't have the personal wealth and the personal connections right out of the gate is shut off. Right. And I think that's incorrect. I mean, traditionally, the preliminary is running in, in late September. I've told you not to focus on politics till after Labor Day. Correct. So, 
and then the election right. is six weeks later. Right. So mm -hmm. it, to, to, to Betty's point, uh, if someone is more of an upstart, doesn't have a lot of money, doesn't have a lot of name recognition, need, needs time to work to work the room, That's correct. they don't have a lot of time. Right, and maybe they're campaigning by literally doing the old-fashioned door-to-door because they don't have the money, whatever. It's like those things take more time than putting in massive ads in the, you know, in the paper or whatever. I mean, sometimes that groundswell is a slower process than, you know, media blast plus everybody knows me, you know. But the campaign doesn't stop when you pull paper. Say it again. A campaign doesn't stop when you pull paper. You can stop campaigning six months before. Oh, I mean, you can. And, and so, I mean, just That's a just high bar to say, you know, I need to start campaigning. You know, I, 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 I'm, I just, I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah. It's possible. I mean, I mean, I mean, sure. I mean, I, I helped with one of the campaigns this past year. I mean, you, know, you, you, you take out your papers in the spring. There's lots of stuff that you're doing in the spring and the summer. You're starting to do your house parties. You're assembling your lists. You're working on your brochures and your website. But the public. And it's not to really key in. The media doesn't really write about the races very much until after Labor Day. Uh, so, uh, for someone who is starting in a, in a weaker position with less name recognition, less personal <coughs> contacts, less money, less money, that person has has less time to break out of that box in a preliminary, a preliminary election scenario. Uh, you can, it's possible. But what Maddie's arguing is, give that person three months and not three weeks. Where in it's sort of you know the the hotter election part of the hotter part of the campaign cycle, uh, they might still lose. You know, they might still not get very far. But you know the public is no no worse for it. Uh, I mean, the worst thing happens you have a runoff in December instead of clearing it in September. Or so uh, and the best case scenario is you only have one election, not two, and you save public money. I also would like to say that even if that candidate that. Um, you know, needs more time because of the things that we're just discussing. If they don't win and they don't even get to the point of a runoff, let's say they get like, you know, 18%, well maybe next time that party will get 32%, and maybe next time. I mean, that's how parties grow. So I think, you know, um, there's also the long view, you know, and I just feel like when everybody's always complaining, there's two parties and they're barely even different. It's like, well then why would we be discouraging Third party, I, I don't, I can't understand that. Well, you know, it's usually mayors who want to preliminary because usually the mayors have contested elections that are two candidates, and they can, after a prelim, they can see where the votes were and where they need to work. And so that's, I mean, talk about an incumbent advantage. Well, they can take a temperature, <laughs> and then they can change their message, which happened in the not this last election, but the one before that. So it was like basically handing the incumbent. Um, you know, like the best study they could possibly have paid for. Who needs polling when you have a preliminary election? Well, I feel when I talk to elected officials here, everyone's always saying, oh, I hope there's not a primary. I hope that guy doesn't file. Don't make me run this twice. What a pain this is going to be. Um, there hasn't been a giant, I mean, I haven't seen a giant push for, for the preliminary thing. Now, maybe there's someone else out there that was the preliminary, and we're going to go down a, another, you know, point until we're not recognizing. Uh, but I generally feel like, in, at least in the elected community, um, because when we have plenary, it's not because of a real strong third party guest trying to challenge it's because of a gadfly. Because your signature requirement is probably too But yeah. today's gadfly is, you know, tomorrow's third party yeah. candidate. I, that's what I'm trying to argue. How long have preliminary elections uh, been in place in North Carolina? I, don't, I, I didn't find anything looking into history. Every other state and city I included in has had a rough run off. This is the first place I've been since I've been in there. And that. It's, a, it's more of a New England phenomenon than a general. How does it work? So everybody goes to the general election and then sometime in December you vote again on the top If no one gets 50. If no one gets 50 plus one, then two or three There's a second later. ballot that is held within X number of days and you prescribe that. Doesn't have to be December. And it might not be. You don't vote on all the races again on that ballot. <coughs> right. No. You would only vote on the ones that didn't hit a fifty-one percent threshold. Well, why doesn't everybody just go to the general? Everyone does go to the general. Yeah, but if you don't get fifty plus one, then you that, have the runoff. But isn't run well, in the runoffs? Isn't the turnout in the runoffs lower? Yes, it is. But it's also dramatically lower. Usually. 
So fewer people are deciding in the runoff piece of it, which is what, again, I go back to, I want the most people in town to vote on that choice. Yeah, but why not just have one candidate? Then you can have 85% vote on that. that doesn't I'm sorry, what you say? sense to me. To narrow the field so that you have more percentage. I, preliminary is not narrowing the field. That's your subjective discussion that is, on that. It oh, is I not narrow, so narrowing the field. A preliminary election is... I ran for election. I ran. I had five people. There were two positions, six of us all together. I had two people who had absolutely, the only reason they were running is I was gay. And they were running against me because they didn't think gay people should be elected in Northampton. Mm -hmm. And they ran against me the same year we did the DPO. Mm -hmm. So I have a little bit of a history going down this path. And we took those two people off right away because they didn't rise to, they didn't even run campaigns. The only reason they ran, and it was put right in the Gazette, was our running against Dave Stevens because he's a gay man. All right. So they, that, let's go right back to how many signatures you need. Uh, let's raise the number of signatures, and then we'll get people like that right out on that note. That particular time, they could, could have been very easily gotten a lot of signatures for against gay people mm -hmm. in this town. Um, so I, I just sort of feel that, that you're going to have to have a winnowing somewhere along the line. And I want the final election. The, final, the election who decides mm -hmm. is the most important election. Okay, and that should have the most number of people, and that's why I believe in the preliminary and the general election because the most number of people will vote in the general election. If the runoff piece it drops off dramatically, it, I mean dramatically, people don't go, and I just don't feel that then you get you know you had ten thousand people voting in November and then in December came around only six thousand people voted. Mm -hmm. That's a problem to me. That that is that's not. I'm not comfortable with that. I would rather have it. Oh yeah, okay. Only three thousand people voted in the preliminary, but ten thousand people voted in the general election. That's a good thing. And, and in the process, we moved our candidates into a smaller number, so it was easier to select. Well, what do you say to all the people who say they don't vote because they don't have a candidate that even represents their viewpoint? Crock is shit. You can call me. <laughs> uh, well, you and I have a gross disagreement. I, I understand. That's blaming the victim. Uh, no, That's, blaming it's the victim. Not blaming the victim. Yes, I'm, I'm saying to, the, to those folks who can get out there and campaign, get out and campaign. They, they no, talk I'm about going door to door. Start now and start running. Yeah, they mm -hmm. have a candidate. Start now for next mayor. Do you mayor. think it's a level playing field with a two party system? As a third party candidate? I mean, I, I just can't. I, I can't abide that. It makes no sense. We don't have we don't party affiliation. Yeah. Yeah. I understand that, that's, but I'm just saying. But that's like, not what she's saying. The, the, uh, and have to, I think we have to look at this, as, as we've said repeatedly, not in the present, but for the future. And what makes the most sense in terms of uh, the way that elections are held? And that's really the question. I mean, uh, you're passionate about it because you have personal experience with it. And uh, Maddie's passionate about it for her own reasons. And so I think that we have to look at what makes sense going forward. The, uh, you said it's a New England phenomenon, or someone said it's a New England phenomenon that, that uh, we have preliminary elections. Uh, I don't know, I know that you, you quote some statistics. I, I don't know, whether, you know what the statistics are in terms of what, what pat voting patterns are for runoffs versus preliminary, but I think that, uh, at least from my sense, is that you also get a very small number of people voting in preliminary elections uh, compared to the general election. So, I agree. Um, I don't know, I, I'm more inclined to go with the runoff. I think that that is, uh, it, I agree with Maddie, that gives more people an opportunity to get out there and say what it is you may have to you may have people that are running for uh, whatever reason that, that you experienced, but it's still, I think that people have a right to get out there even if their views are unpopular. The mechanism versus the, I don't fault the mechanism for the fact that the third party candidates aren't getting the publicity. I fault, I fault the fourth estate and the people who put the debates forward that aren't including them prior to the preliminary election. I fully agree with Maddie that those people should have an equal opportunity 
prior to the preliminary election to be fully out there and doing that. But that's not something that's in the charter. Okay, so I don't and they should, they should be able to have, have a column in the paper articulating their point of view. They should be able to, to um, be participating in X number of debates, just as like we have Y number of debates between the preliminary and the final. There should be that many beforehand. And what's happened in the last couple of years, because they've been trying to exclude this third party person, Roy, that, they, that, that the people who sponsor the debates are no longer even sponsoring the debates until after the preliminary. And that's wrong. I, I, that, but that's their choice, not the charter. But Roy was in debates. He, he was in debates when it was just Claire and him. He's we have not had a debate in town where a person who had filed the papers is not involved. Yeah. There's never been a debate since I've lived here for, for six years. I, I, I've heard Roy W.H. Roy was in debates. Yeah. He lost in the preliminaries and he was out of debates. Mm -hmm. uh, but we haven't had a problem with media institutions saying, you filed your paperwork too bad, you're not good enough. Right. Um, there may be an issue that they don't get enough debates because they don't get to the ground very long. And we're really only talking about Roy because we have that. we have had huge fields of candidates for the most part. Um, but I don't really have a problem with getting them on the platform if they've done the basic legwork. There's a general media issue that there's not a lot of media coverage of these elections, period. Uh, they've already getting oxygen in, in, in that respect. Maddie, let's just put down a path of three people running for school committee in Ward 3. Okay? You've got to play out your scenario. Three people running in Ward 3. All the other elections decided on election day with 51%. Mm -hmm. Ward 3 didn't happen. Mm -hmm. okay, you had a hotly contested mayor race between two great people. You had Everybody city council, out. big, big, big numbers. Ward 3. Mm -hmm. How many people are going to come out to that election in December when I'm running around doing holiday shopping? I mean, with all due respect, mm -hmm. that's when we have to put the election. You stick it in the middle of the holiday season. No, it usually comes three weeks after the primary election. Yeah, Thanksgiving. Right. Or early, early December. Early December. Usually early December. Thanksgiving. Okay, so I'm just, just yeah. saying, this, yeah. this is where you're putting it, you're timing it. But you could flip, you could flip that and say you're, you're having the prelim in September right as school is kicking off and you have, you know, a real low time. Well, I don't problem with that. If we were to go that way, I would, I would change the calendar around because I don't like the calendar. That, that hurts as well. But I'm just, just playing out the scenarios of where we're going with this. If we're, the ultimate decision is to get a large number of people deciding, getting people out there and participating to vote, so you create mandates for change or you create participation, but if people are then, you, then you want to have as many people running as possible. That's you don't want people. I agree. Race. I agree. And then, but I, I, and I'm, I'm less, in the decision on the little scale that Gail gave us, I'm less passionate than I'm articulating. <laughs> I just want you to know. Well, I the more debates no, come through. No, you experienced the trauma, which yeah. I, like, you know, I feel sick for you when you gave that example, just personally. But I there, and, and I was the person who, in one election, literally talked Roy out of it. Mm -hmm. I took him out to lunch, and I talked Roy out of running because it was $18,000. No other contestant of ours were there. It was Roy's fifth time running. Mm -hmm. Truth be told, Roy's coming over to do me uh, work on my house tomorrow. I know Roy that well. Roy. We were in recovery together. I know him that well. Did you let him order off the menu? No. <laughs> no, we have parameters, box. <laughs> and this is all getting recorded. <laughs> and for Salvo House. Yes. So I want people right. not to put I him in a box. I would like to say he's chairman of the Tennis Association at right. Salvo, which is really important. However, are we, how far, given that, uh, no, and I hear your point about looking 50 years out. Okay, I'm going to stop. It's a tough one. I, I, it's a tough one. I, I, you know. Wait, okay. Because this elections can raise a lot of passionate responses, um, and we're, if we're already saying it's a right should be explored in a study, maybe we should just be saying if we're, we're going to change this, let's, let's have it be done on a separate track and not try to slapdash it right here. 
So how does the committee do both? This is to explore other election options, period. And timing as well? Because it sounds like if they can do runoff three weeks after the primary, why not do the preliminary three weeks before the Exactly. Right. Exactly. I feel much better yeah. if we yeah. were to flip the calendar. That, right. it's like, mm -hmm. that makes it a lot easier. So at least you have a full debate, or almost a full debate. That, that was my question, is what, how close to the actual election can you have the preliminary? What? We could change that. You have, you, need week, you, you, have to, you have to set the election machines. Like that takes a period of time, and I have no clue. I literally have no clue. I would have to do some research or some of that. I mean, elections are so highly regulated by the state. There's not a lot of, you know, you can get rid of prelims, but if you want to do a runoff, we would have to figure out if that's so, Stephen, okay with the state. Can I ask you, though, because you, you showed some proclivity towards eliminating a preliminary election, but yet you're not a, a, you're not a runoff. What, what's the solution to the, you know, a three-way close? I don't have a strong. You, you say let the person who gets 38% or something like that? Or is that, I'm just wondering what, what the model is if you're saying no preliminary elections? No preliminary elections, and you know, we, 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 we're getting rid of preliminary elections. Everybody that took out papers gets on the November back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but what, what is required to win? Can somebody with less than a majority win the election? Top vote. Just the top vote yeah. And that happened in East Hampton when they elected a mayor with less than 50% of the vote. Right. So that would be all inclusive, and anybody could run. And as far as like what you, the candidates who have less experience, they could start, you can start campaigning two years before a campaign and build your, they do it all the time. I mean, we're constantly in, in election mode. So they can do that. I mean, and they can raise money and so forth. And, and be valid, because I totally agree. I think the more in there, like you say, Roy Martin, you talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. That guy's a smart guy. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I agree with you there. But is there, you had earlier talked about not wanting to put an elected person in the position of having um, just a morality. So what, what's that like? I mean, how bad would it be if that happened a lot? Well, I am not in favor of eliminating the preliminary. Yeah, I, understand I would either go with, that would be my second choice, mm -hmm. but I don't like the, that's even worse. I mean, let's go back a couple of years in East Hampton. All those people ran for mayor. They didn't have a preliminary focus in there. I think it was four or five people were running for mayor. And it was, it was uh, I think Mike won with 40% or less. It was, it was, you know, a small number. And I don't think that's a good way to start governing. I think so you should govern. Question. You should govern with fifty-one percent. You should get as close to that as possible. Did he have trouble governing in that after that election when he only had? I don't know. And I, because I, I mean, if we did have like a third candidate, if we did have a Green Party that was viable, I mean, I just think in Europe they have these. You know, you don't win by a massive landslide when you have multiple parties. I mean, if we had a viable third party, obviously no one in this room, you know, wants a viable third party on the hate, you know, platform. But if we had a viable third party on some kind of green thing or just whatever, you know, I mean, that's going to decrease. It's going to be harder for somebody to hit 51%. And I, and I don't... But that's where the IRB comes in. And that's where I've, I've become very in favor of the IRB. I don't have a problem with that issue. All right. But uh, <coughs> uh, what I have a problem with Florida and New Hampshire in 2000. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. That's where I, I, I have problems with the, the active third party. And that's what makes me very uncomfortable with not having a majority win. I don't know the exact situation you stand in, but just knowing that that, that might have reelected since. He's yes. been the only mayor. Right. right. Pre presumably, he wasn't. If, if you didn't vote for him, he wasn't necessarily your last choice right. of the lot. Right. I mean the, the so as long as you as long as you're people's second choice, even though it's not literally it's a runoff, but uh, you will probably have enough of men that you could govern effectively. The concern is if that you are not just the plurality, but really opposed by the majority, yeah. and now you have hundred percent of the power, even though you don't really have the public's backing to do what is the one. That's what happened to me. Right.
Okay, they had three people running for governor. They had a right wing cr crank who's there now, the governor, and I don't mind saying that. Who's got 37% of the vote. <laughs> I said that here. 37% of the vote, and he's now running it, and he is burning that city into the uh, burning that state into the yeah. into the ground. That, that's that's the that's the bad scenario. So I guess I just have to say though that when we talk about getting 51% of the vote. You know, I hear you say that, but I just have to say that, you know, I'd like to know what is the Latino vote turnout in Northampton? I mean, there are many, many underrepresented people, and they are not getting candidates. I just think it's a false, it's a false number to say 51% of the people, you know, liked candidate A. It's like... I have 70% of the time that I vote, I'm voting for the lesser of two evils. So it's like, and then there's all the people that don't vote because there's no one on the ballot that looks like them, who, 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 who thinks like them. And so I just think that that's, that to me just, I don't know, clinging to the 51%, that doesn't make me sleep at night, the 51%, and say we have a really you know, representative democracy. I don't think that's the case. I think what it allows, though, is it allows you to avoid having a spoiler take office. If a, if a vote is split in sort of a third, 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 you can get these weird outcomes. So I think right. that's the purpose of language. Is that the point you were trying to make, David? Yeah, I mean, again, I, I refer to Maine in this last election. But you have to go back and you have to read what happened in Maine. Two progressives ran, one is an independent, and there was now a right-wing Republican Tea Party member who's now governor of Maine. And not reflective of Maine's... Not reflective of Maine's diversity. Mm -hmm. Because the progressive vote split. Split. You know, and, and with all due respect, that could happen here. But I guess what I would say to you is that... If that happened here, Maddie, how would you feel? Well, I guess... And I that would, person would now be in for four years. I guess I would say to you, you know, that's the chaos of democracy. And, and when you argue against term limits, you're saying, let the chips fall where they may. But here you're saying we have to control the chips lest, you know, these... Uh, you know, we have some uncontrollable outcome. I don't see that as a consistent position. But don't you want the will of the voters to be more or less reflected in the outcome and who takes office? And in this main instance... Well, I'm, I'm saying runoff. I'm, I'm saying runoff. Anyway, in this case. Yeah, I like runoff. Runoff okay. I, I can live with. Yeah. Okay. As long as we adjust the calendar. But I don't know if we can mm -hmm. even legally do that. Mm -hmm. That's another whole little hurdle. Mm -hmm. um, but the preliminary, I, I, it, it's again one of those, I hear what you're saying about people not being involved. And, you know, you cut me down when, when I made the flippant comment, and I'll take it back. I do want more people to participate. I don't think that is the hurdle that is stopping people from participating. Okay? We don't have people participating on committees. All right? We don't have people. That's how you, I got known. I started participating on committees here, mm -hmm. and then I ended up being tapped to be an elective office. Mm -hmm. All right? That's how I, I, I grew up in the system. Mm -hmm. So if, if we had 50 people applying for X committee and they were being turned down because of their race, ethnicity, low income status, whatever, then we'd have a different kind of a problem. But what, what I see is that we don't even get the people in the door to consider those as civic duties, that they should be participating and being engaged in their communities. That's where the emphasis should be. That's where we should be spending our time and energy, is working in that area of empowering different populations of this community to step forward and say, I want to participate because this is my city. I live here. I want to part play with what goes on here. I don't think tinkering with the elections is going to achieve that. That's not going to get any more people to play. And you're going to get more people to play if we start talking to neighborhood groups and saying, hey, you have some good points. You should be <coughs> in this committee. You should come forward and participate. So your feeder system is your multiple the bottoms. I totally agree with what you said. At word for word. That's how it's that's how you're going to do it. And it takes time. 
to, to, to like you said, you get on these committees, you get yourself known, you get involved, you do things, and then eventually you, you may want to run for office, and you've got there's you've got a track record basically. I just and people can look at it and say, hey, I, I feel the way that she does that if you have if you have a member of your community out there vying for a public office and they don't make it, at least you've had an opportunity to vote for somebody and then you may get more involved. I, I, I see it differently. I think that the more opportunity people have to vote for somebody that they can relate to, the more likely you're going to have citizen participation in government. But then why aren't those folks Running for the school committee that we couldn't find people. I don't know why. <laughs> but I think that's but a very complicated issue. But, 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 but why that's are they running for mayor? Why are people coming out of the woodwork and saying, I'm qualified to run for mayor because I want to articulate a point of view? Why don't they start running for school committee? We're not talking just mayor, we're talking all the election all the way across the board. Yeah. For all offices. David, don't fix that on school committee. I would have run. I was notified five days before the filing deadline. Um, no one had announced that there was an opening, and they were scrambling. No one knew, and I was out of town. And <laughs> I, I still think elections are the backbone of our democracy, and they should, we, we, we should, that should be a point of accessibility and not a point of exclusivity on a core, core level. We need to move on, Matt. I, I, mean, <laughs> I think that we should recommend the study. I don't think that we looked at elections enough or held a hearing on elections that we can change the election process. Anyway. I think that's something that they need to look at. What, what does that mean in terms of the charter? Doing this, doing this study? I mean, I, I think that means status quo and lay out different options and separate a narrative saying we recommend the council set up a commission to look at this seriously and try to come up with alternatives that could maximize participation. If we're talking status quo, I'd recommend the shortest time frame possible between the prelim and the general election. I agree with that. So you're abandoning the runoff? Oh, I'm not abandoning it, but if I'm saying, you know, I'm not going to block it. I'm yeah. saying we're stuck here. The compromise, you know, to move forward is to at least give those people the longest time to get a committee together, to fundraise, to get media attention, you know, if they aren't already fully networked into the system. My concern with putting this to a committee is it sounds like Although I support the IRB, it sounds like there's some real technical funding hurdles to that. The state may have to get involved. That's a long-term solution. Um, and I, I don't see, I think it's going to be difficult once this process is over to affect change, especially if to affect it a medium-term solution. If the long-term, given where technology is headed, is more toward an IRB, I, I think we're talking about changes coming in 10, 15 years. Um, and I, I prefer to propose something for here and now. And that would probably have run off. That's for Gail, you're awful quiet. Yeah, I, I, I'm just listening and learning. I feel stuck because I think some of the things that everybody's talking about, about accessibility, involvement in community and stuff like that is so much easier than the election system. And all we have to tinker with is these little pieces of the election system that don't all together touch uh, really big social issues that cause people not to be involved in their community. So, um, and, and of our choices, there are no I mean, I would really like to know the answers to can we change the time frame. If we can change the time frame, I think we've got um, at least something that we can do in the short run that makes us all feel sort of okay. So on, on, on phase 25, just to get it in line, five and six, how would you change that? What I am aware of in terms of elections, that the preliminary 
primary election, in some communities it's held one week, and in other communities it's held the following Tuesday. I just following elections across the Commonwealth. I do know that there are two Wednesday or two Tuesdays, excuse me, in September that have been acted as voting days in late September. I don't know why we have the third or the fourth and why the other one is the third or the fourth, I don't know. But I just know that there are two separate days that people have been voting. I think your big thing is going to be Wendy, and I think the big thing is going to be how quickly she can turn the machines around and do that. So I think what we need is someone who will have a conversation with Wendy about this issue. Is there anyone who would like to do that? Uh, and that would be tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Conversation. To bring it in. Sure. I'll ask her what is the, well, this is what, tell me if this is what I'm asking her. This, what is the functional minimal amount of time that you need between a preliminary election and a general election on, just based on the mechanics of? And is there any state law that she's aware of? Okay. And I don't think that Maddie, if you could ask that question, I'd I bring up uh, the runoff concept. Yeah, two successive elections. Not necessarily. Yeah. Just Say it again. Two, successive, two successive elections. Yeah. Bring, up, bring up the runoff run run concept. Is, is there a state law that's against runoff? I don't know anybody in the state that's doing runoffs. It's all preliminary, you know. And there's a technical issue that has to be changed. This, this preliminary election was written for. Um, a place where the, the primary election is just a man. It's all in the I should say, I know we before an election, not just a man. Can I just add one more comment? Getting back to your comment about runoffs being less valid because of lower vote or not. Reflecting back on places I've lived in Texas, California, Illinois, I don't you recall, in NBC, um, I don't recall that ever being an issue. People thinking, uh huh, they won the runoff, but the voter turnout was lower. You have no, you know, you're not a valid candidate. I, that's never really come up. It's never occurred to me. I never heard people talk about it in the way that we're talking about problems with preliminary elections. Um, it's just the way things are done, and but it does. It doesn't seem to present the problems that pre preliminary elections do in this setting. There is lower turnout, but I think no voting is also a preference. It can be perceived as a preference. People don't perceive the need to go out to vote. So, if there's similar lower voting in preliminaries and runoffs, then I don't know what that's. A, you know, we we've, we've said that there there's lower a, a turnout in both of those. Right. So if those are similar, then I think we have to choose between them for, different, you know, for different reasons. I mean, the risk with lower turnout is an organized minority outguns a, a less organized majority if you don't get a true reflection of where the city's at. Uh, and uh, I think what Todd is saying is gen generally correct. When the turnout drops in December runoffs, usually it drops in a proportional way. So it's not all that radically different than if you had the higher turnout. Uh, but if you know, you're on the risk that someone's really got a uh, a real intense, passionate following, and then sneaks one past you. You know, then, then you might have a thing that people have some fires remorse about when they wake up in the morning. Um, in preliminary situation, um, if that happens, the, the organized minority, you know, uh, squeezes one out. Um, it gets corrected at the higher turnout in general. Um, so. Uh, <coughs> I don't think there's, I don't have a huge, you know, in that, so I don't have a huge difference. Generally speaking, I think the majority will works out either way. Um, but you run a little bit of a risk in the traditional runoff that a minority person could, could sneak one past you. But can't that happen in the general too? Sure. I mean, I mean it always can. I mean, turnout can generally be low enough where um, true majority will is not reflected. And then some people complain that we generally have 50% turnout. And, 50% of, of the city is not participating, so are we getting a true reflection that way? Uh, perhaps, perhaps 
if you had 100 percent, it would be the same because it's it's proportionally not changing all that much. 18 to 20,000 voters in the city, depending on the election. 15 to 18,000 will vote during a presidential election. 12,000, give or take, will vote during a gubernatorial election. A municipal election will see anywhere between 8 and 10, as low as 6 in the past three decades. That was only when there was like, no real contested race for mayor. Generally, it's more you know, 9 to 10. You yeah. don't have a picture for that. No, 9 to 10, so it's, it's, it's low numbers. Right. In, in terms of the number of registered voters, right. which is 18,000, if you get 8 voting, there's a problem. What I like about the runoff is you have more people potentially voting for their first choice in a general election. And then you have, your, it's almost like a modified instant runoff voting. Then you have a second bite at the apple, and maybe that's where you're like, whatever. This one's not as bad as that one. But I think that that is just a really like, Anytime we can give people, a, you know, more of a chance to go to the poll and vote for their first choice candidate, I don't think we should be afraid of that. My suggestion is that uh, we move to signature requirements and then come back and decide what we're going to do. Okay. We've got to move on. Seven that minutes. They've all three stated our positions. We're setting a chart. We're setting <coughs> to the committee, or we're not setting. I'm going to ask Lenny Mass of these questions. And then we'll talk about it on Wednesday. But you're having fun writing all this down, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to write out the minutes. What the hell? We got this. <laughs> Just going to come back to hobby. We're going to run again. That strategic decision ten years ago. Okay. Uh, the only reason I don't, I actually might we'll just call the evening because the number of signatures is was an area that Mark did work in, and he is one meeting away, seven minutes away from joining us. Uh, so I would just actually kick that down the road and have him participate in that conversation. He did all the work on it. If you remember, he had uh, positions on it. And uh, I think that it would be fair that since we are literally seven minutes away from that decision, there's no point to kind of push that in there. Is there anything else to come before this body at this time? You want to go to this initiative and... You want to pick up any of those, anybody? Oh, these are going to be... Yeah, because it's... Just check if it's passed. Oh, what's that? The initiative. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it, You're trying to take something off the table. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, I think the initiative and the referendum are other than maybe the percentage requirements and how they're how they're written um, are. I think we, we want to ma maintain those. Everybody in agreement with that? Yes. Okay, so we're all there of that. And then it comes down to the pre-petition and the recall, which I think are deserving of more discussion. Okay. Now, do you want to envision any of the signature requirements on those? We could actually maybe get some of that done. Gail, do you want to take us through any of that? You mean that, um, on the signature requirements? Yeah. Uh, we cannot reply to Mr. Bell. Okay. So tomorrow we will come back and look at the free petition as a standalone, whether we should have it or not, plus the signature requirements. We will look at signature requirements for initiative and referendum, and we'll take a look at the concept of recall. We're also going to be looking at compensation and finding out, uh, Maddie, thank you for doing the homework, uh, getting with Matt, uh, with Wendy on those issues, and we'll get into talking about signature requirements for elected positions. Okey-dokey. Please. Let's go to Red first, and we'll wrap that up as the last. I'm just comment. curious. The, our our meeting ends Thursday. We have a meeting scheduled for the 17th. What, I just wonder what that was for. Is that the final meeting? Um. And and Mary did some clarifications for us, so let me put out a new timeline here. Uh, the timeline is that next Thursday. Yes, is the city council meeting where we have to present the document. They will not be voting on that document. Okay. They will just be accepting yes. that document. 
Thereby, we have until how many hours before? 5 p.m. on Wednesday. 5 p.m. on Thursday. Okay, 5 p.m. on Thursday to have that information to them. So we have to hand something to the city council 5 p.m. on Thursday. No, a week Thursday. A week Thursday. The night of the meeting. The night of the meeting, because they're not voting on it, they're just accepting it, okay. saying whatever. Are we making a verbal presentation that night? Because, yes, and because our, we are on the agenda. Yes, you're on the Be agenda. Because we have a sunset clause. We are no longer empowered past that date. Okay? Just so we're aware of that. Option is to complete everything, get it done, finish. Second option is to say we, we need an extension of two weeks or whatever. That's another option, just to put it out there. Uh, the third option is to say here's the, what we have. Uh, there are some holes we were not able to finish. The whole special acts is a hole that we're not going to be able to get to. Uh, we recommend these study committees, and good luck with whatever. You know, we did our, in our timeline, this is how far we moved the ball forward. These are our recommendations. We had talked about having position papers, and the reason we were going to meet next week on the 17th was to review our position papers. Megan raised the question of, of uh, can we circulate those position papers ahead of time so people had a chance to read them before that meeting. And I believe that is fine with the open meeting laws. You will check that with Wendy. You can't comment on them. You can't write back and say, oh, Megan, the count is wrong. You can't even do that. It's just, you know, let it go. Here it is. You can read it physically before the meeting. Okay. No commenting. You can't, okay? You didn't represent my position well. Any of that kind of stuff, you can't put in there. But you can send the position papers around prior to that meeting. Is that helpful that people want to do that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. And uh, the other thing is tomorrow we're going to have to make sure that everybody understands which one of those positions they're writing and what they're writing. And how long approximately? Like oh, 30, 40 pages. <laughs> 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 presentation takes 15 to 20 minutes before council. So you have to decide how much you want to each take for the presentation. Well, I hope. With all due respect, I don't think we want nine talking heads up there. I think we want to submit the charter with these position background papers and a chance that I hope everyone is able to attend next Thursday's meeting, but to do make a brief presentation that will focus on the history, very similar to the press release you and I have already talked about. We met so many times, so many people came forward. This is the information we collected. We heard about a variety of different opinions. Here are some of the quotes off the top. You know, we're recommending a few major changes for your mayor. Uh, we chose not to do things there, elaborating in the position papers. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Goodbye. Zach. You could also do a PowerPoint for maybe you have one slide or ten where you put up there and you general consensus decisions. Some presentations have had a PowerPoint while the person has been saying, okay, and we did this, and we did this. So, oh, we're trying to sort of build some momentum um, with the council. Um, what, what's, the, what's the purpose of our presentation? What's it, who's our audience? Uh, is this mainly for public consumption, for the press, for the council? Um, the order. The order seems to have to be done. That, but that's the pro forma. I'm just wondering who's our real audience. Are we trying to sell it? Are you saying? Yeah, yeah. I guess trying to sell it. Um, yeah, I, I think that, get the, I think that we are selling a document that needs to go forward to build momentum towards an ultimate November vote. Uh, we are the second step in the process. The Charter Review Committee that Alan uh, chaired, that Mark was on, was the first step. We have now done the public comment period, we've taken notes, we've accumulated a lot of stuff that's up on the website that people now can go and read and help formulate their opinions. As the city council goes forward with this, it's in your lap. How do you envision that step to move forward? I don't know. <laughs> that was a choice. That was a choice. <laughs> um, it is my hope that the city council will, will 
accept this document and not refer it to the committee, but take it up as a committee as a whole so they don't have to do it twice. Because they're going to be under time constraint as well. So, I mean, I, we'll figure out the mechanics of how that, that gets done. Then they'll have to schedule, I don't know, I mean, I, could, I don't know, the city council will have to schedule, I guess, uh, meetings on this topic alone just to get through. I mean, they may, I don't think that we can do it at regular council meetings. So they may have to double up on meetings for a couple of months. <laughs> so the expectation is they would likely have to hold public meetings and public forums as well to get feedback on. I'm not sure that, I'm not sure they'll do public forums. I'm sure all the meetings will be in public. Okay. okay. So they will have public comment sessions. Right. right. So people are right. so people okay. can do this. But Hopefully we have taken and created a pool of information up until this point. But nobody's paying attention to us. They'll start paying attention at the next step. Okay? And then they can change the document, create the document any way they want. They may throw ours out and start all over again. <laughs> they may say, oh, great, let's rubber stamp this and move it along. Right, it's up to the city council who ultimately is responsible for this document. They gave us the charge. We, are give, we did our homework in the timeline that we were supposed to do our timeline and handed it back to them. This is what we could accomplish within the 120 days that they gave us. Uh, now the other wild card out there, I said before, when this process started, there has to be another special act passed that allows us to go on the state ballot. Right. And I don't think there's going to be a problem, but it's still, you know, if Secretary Galvin just decides he doesn't want to do it, <laughs> You know, but there's only four questions that, that the Attorney General has approved for the state ballot. But there so have, right, I can't there, argue that there's another right. question going to... But frequently at those elections, there are municipal questions that have popped up, too. We've had regional ones yeah. okay. that are in the Senate District, for instance, on single-payer. I remember about four years ago, for everybody in Stan's district, we voted on single-payer. So those have been approved and put forward and moved along. Uh, it's not a huge hurdle, but it is a hurdle that could trip us up. Right, and it's my understanding that, 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 uh, that the mayor has alerted the delegation, and I, I would probably, you know, speak to him um, this week to schedule an actual face-to-face -face and go to the state house. I've talked to, yeah, no, I've talked to Stan frequently about this, and, and Peter's on board, so I mean, they understand what, what the okay, timeline good. is, good. so it, it, uh, those are not... The issues. The issues will be: Is it Galvin's office? And I, I have not had much contact with the Galvin's office. In the short time. I just want to suggest that for the presentation to the city council, that we should be giving them our full draft of the thing, our full draft, um, the narrative. Maybe if we're lucky enough to have to write like an executive summary, a one-page summary of the main things, oh, and that you should be the only person speaking, and that all of us should be there. That, you know, just to be with you. I would like you all to be there, especially if there are questions in your specific area of your position papers. I would refer and say, "Yeah, why don't you answer that question?" Mm -hmm. Um, I'll be sending out a couple more um, articles. You, you see it started with Article 2, so it must be an Article 1. Uh, but th those articles are pro forma, Massachusetts standard charter legal language that is really not debated. So, but I'll get them out so you can read them uh, tomorrow. But you mentioned the definition section also? Yes, it's in there. It's in there. Oh. Thank you.
Yeah. 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 Yeah.